Okay, welcome along everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, to you uh, our speaker, AJ. AJ travels all around the world presenting um, free seminars to people on how they can uh, develop their soul and uh, reach the very highest levels of development in the celestial realms. So let's give AJ a, a really enthusiastic <laughs> Sunshine Coast welcome. Thanks, Peter. Um, well, lots of you were here yesterday, so, uh, so you know some of the subject matter that we're probably going to cover today. Today, I was going to uh, make things a little more personal. And, uh, and try to help each of us connect to some of our own emotions, to give you a bit of an idea of what it's like to really connect to the deepest emotions that are within you rather than avoiding them. That sound all right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds all right now. <laughs> we'll see if it still sounds all right later. <laughs> and, uh, I wanted though to say a few things firstly because I, I think there are some feelings that, that I got yesterday in particular and also over the last few groups that I've done that, about some of the things that I say. Um, one thing I'd like to comment about religion generally is that there's a common viewpoint that because I'm stating the truth about different things that that then means that I feel that there is no point in any religion and there's no point in any uh, philosophies of life or any of those kind of things. And how I feel is actually quite the opposite to that. Mm. How I feel is that absolutely everything that you've ever been led to on your path of development has been needed for you to open up a certain part of your soul, to be ready to hear what you're hearing now. Mm. Right? And also, every single person in every, every religion on earth has the ability to directly connect to God. Now obviously many of them don't, because many of them are so engrossed intellectually in their form of religion that they don't realise that the power is within themselves to connect to God. But every single person does have the power to connect to God, whatever religion they are in. So if you are currently in a religious form of any type, I'm not ever saying to leave it. What I'm saying is to start incorporate the feelings and emotions that you need to incorporate in order to connect to God directly. Yeah. All right? And once you do that, you will also start talking about truths. You'll start telling the truth. Now, of course, in some religions that might be a bit of a problem. Because some religions are very, very firm about what they believe truth to be. And that is often very different to what God's truth is. And in those kind of religions you may find yourself excommunicated. Um, as I myself have found myself excommunicated. But the important thing for you to realise is that every time you connect to God and speak your truth, you are also helping every single person around you do the same thing. And so if you want to stay practising a certain religion, there is no harm in that, aside from when you are harming your own soul through anything you do to detune from your own emotion. So if you can bear that in mind, that would be good. So when I talk about things like Buddha being in the sixth sphere of the spirit world, for example, which is the location he is, in, he is currently in, and that he is not in a state of one went with God, that is not a criticism of, the Buddhist, of Buddha himself or of the Buddhist movement. All it is is a statement of the truth of the matter right now. Now... He has the ability to connect to God, just as anyone else here does. He has the ability to actually become at one with God too. But, like all people, we all need to come to accept the truth about where we are at some point in our lives. And that is something that he will need to do as well, if he wishes to be at one with God. Now, while that may challenge your personal belief or your personal viewpoint of where Buddhist is in relation, to, where Buddha is in relationship to God. All I can do is just stay the truth of what I know at the time. That's all. And it's not, it's not a feeling. I don't have a feeling in me of criticism about that. If you have a feeling that I have criticised somebody about that, 
then that's the feeling of your judgment. Does that make sense? And you need to allow yourself to look at why you feel judgmental about that or why you feel challenged by what I've just said. And that would be the case even if I was lying to you. You still need to look at your own emotions and look at what's challenging you. All right? And whether I'm bopping you in the nose, which hopefully I'll never do, or I'm speaking lovingly to you, either way, there's something going on within you. Isn't there? And that's what I'm encouraging you to do, to look at what that might be and to work your way through those issues. Now, obviously, if I'm going to bop you in the nose, then you're not going to listen to me for very long. And, uh, and, and that's fine too, in the end, isn't it? You will learn something from that law of attraction that you have put out there. So, with all the comments that I've made about religion generally and different people and where they are in the spirit world specifically, Please bear in mind that it's not a judgement of them. It's just a statement of the truth about them. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And this is what brings me to a, to a comment about judgement. Judgement is an emotion, not a statement. Mm -hmm. Do you get what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. Judgement is an emotion where you believe yourself to know better or feel better or think better or act better than somebody else. And when you do that, you are actually projecting an emotion at them that you are better than they are. And that is a judgment. A judgment isn't stating the truth. So I could say to someone, you're quite detuned from your emotions right now. Now, I could say that with an intention of trying to put them down. That's a judgment. Or I could say it with the intention of trying to help them expose the fact that they're not in tune with their emotions. That's love. How will you tell the difference? By your own reaction. Yeah. Only I will know what my intention was. Because you may not know. You may assume it to be something different. Mm -hmm. And so I need to be honest in my own connection with my own, with my own connection with God. I need to be honest about whether I am feeling judgmental or whether I am coming from a place of love. And my suggestion is that every time you feel you're being judgmental, every time you feel that there's something in this emotionally for you, to just stop what you're saying and to ask yourself, why am I doing that? Ask yourself what's going on inside of yourself. Now, that also relates to some... Um, Things that, like today, I'll be commenting about different people I've met. And uh, most of the people I met realise that sooner or later I'll probably comment about them. <laughs> and just as like I comment about myself constantly in terms of tell you the truth about what I'm processing. My feelings are that every single person is naked when it comes to their emotional state. How many of you don't want to be naked? <laughs> Depends who's there. <laughs> I mean emotionally. Oh, okay. <laughs> and if you have a feeling that you want to retain your privacy, that is your right, of course, but at one point or other in the future, you will find that you actually do not have any privacy. Nope. Right? And what I mean by that is that emotionally, every single celestial spirit knows exactly every single thing you have ever done in your life right now. So right now, there's whole groups of spirits with us, and the majority of those spirits know exactly every single thing that you're ashamed of, every single thing that you've done, every single thing that's happened to you, and in fact... For the majority of you, they know far more about what happened to you than you know. Yeah. How do they know that? Because all of those records are in your soul. All of those memories and emotions are all there in your soul. And they're all also displayed in your, what they call the aura, or the emanations, or the energy that comes from your soul through your spirit body. And so they know exactly what you're feeling. Now, if I'm a malevolent spirit, if I'm a spirit who wants to misuse that, then I'll say, oh yeah... He's got some anger. I can use that anger to get something I want out of him. 
or, oh yeah, he's got an issue with sexual promiscuity. I can actually use that to have some sex with some women on earth still. Right? Or, oh yeah, she's got some hatred of men. I can use that to really, you know, hurt some men around her. You know? Now, obviously, they can see these things within you. A nice, bright spirit who's close to God, who's at one with God, would say, oh, Poor person has that feeling or emotion. What can I do to help them expose that emotion and feel it so that it's no longer in them? So one day in the future, you will realise, if you don't already, that everything is based upon character. Do, do you understand what I mean by that? Everything, in terms of your progression, will be based on character, in terms of how you feel in your heart, whether your intention or desire is pure or not. Everything in terms of your progression with God is based on character. In other words, are you pure in your desires? If you think you can fool God, then you've got another thing coming. You can get away with lots here on earth, right? You can. You can get away with lots in your marriage, and you can get away with lots with your children, and you can get away with lots with the government, and you can get away with lots at work if you want to. Uh, as soon as you develop the intentions down that road, you can get away with lots of different things. But you can't get away with anything with God. Mm -hmm. And at some point, you want to not get away with anything with God and actually become real and be truthful about that. And that's all I'm trying to be with you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you can bear those things in mind, even with every comment that I make, these are not judgments of you. So yesterday, there were some times when I'd say to somebody, you know, you're back into your mind again. That's not a judgment of you. I'm not trying to put the person down for being back into their mind. I'm just trying to help them see that they're back in their mind and they're not connected with their soul. Right? So if you bear in mind that today, that would be very helpful. And also with all the things that you've heard from me or, or watched the DVDs about, that would be very good. All right. So yesterday, what we talked about was a fair bit about emotions. I can't remember what I took. <laughs> You'll have to watch the DVDs to see that if you haven't weren't here yesterday. But we focused on one thing, and that was experiencing the emotion. How to actually connect with and experience emotion. And I wanted to talk a lot more about that today. And we raised, in just brief ways yesterday, about how we know we've actually completed dealing with an emotion. How do you know you're finished? And we'll talk about that today as well. So we'll talk about those things. But before we begin those things, is there any questions that anybody has from yesterday that they'd like to have addressed first? And then perhaps we can go uh, from, from there into, into these new subjects. No? Yeah, um, getting back to that thing about dinosaurs yesterday. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, it does, it like... It feels to me that it's just hard to accept. Like, I've, I've heard that um, scientists have found um, teeth marks in dinosaur bones mm -hmm. that match the teeth of Tyrannosaurus. Yep. So, you know, that seems to me like a bit of evidence to back up that Tyrannosaurus was a meat eater. Right, just a brief comment firstly, and then I'm going to ask a question about your emotion. Right. Um, firstly, most of the things God, God designed in terms of uh, creatures, many of them were designed for cleaning up purposes. Do you understand what I mean by that? Like, most insects, for example, are there to clean up things, to actually, you know, decay and break down things that have already died. And many animals that God created also have that role to actually clean up and break down things that have, have, that have passed on. And if you look at, like in a rainforest, for example, you'll see that's the case. And many of the creatures God designed were designed exactly for that purpose. So the thing with the fossilised record, it's impossible to tell whether the animal killed the other animal or they just ate it as carrion. Right? And, and so a lot of what you see and what's then assumed you know, we've got to be careful of what the data is and then what the assumption is, right? The data is, I see teeth marks in the bone of a... a, a Tyrannosaurus rex teeth marks in the bone of another dinosaur. That's the data. 
our assumption then is that Tyrannosaurus rex must have killed and ate that dinosaur. But that's not a valid assumption. Right? And if you think about it, that makes sense, so, doesn't it? What you're saying is it was a scavenger. Yes, and in fact, if you look today, almost every, like a lot of the birds, for example, like vultures and a lot of the carrion type of birds, most of them are eating animals that have already died. And in fact, that was their, one of their purposes, was to do that. That's to, a good explanation, to, to because I know in the, in the past, when I've sort of had issues with things that you've said, when I've brought it back to you, you've given me a bigger picture. Yeah. Which enables me to see into it. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a good explanation. So I'm glad I brought it up. Yeah. Now let's address the emotion. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be doing with this with all of you today. Um, please don't be afraid to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> and at times you keep getting stuck on intellectual things, and that is taking you away from the emotion. The truth is that explanation that I've just given to you would have come to you as a possibility if there wasn't an emotion inside of you that prevented that from coming to you. Do you follow me? So what was the emotion inside of you that prevented that from coming to you? So God wants to give you, this applies to all of you, God wants to give you the answers directly. He doesn't want you to have to ask somebody else to get the answers. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. In other words, you can get all the answers from God. Now, those answers will come to you via your soul. And so the question then has to be asked, why didn't that answer come to me via my soul? So that's the question I'm asking you. What do you reckon that might be? What did you feel when I made that statement? Those are feelings. It didn't feel like it resonated with my own inner truth. Right, so my truth disagreed. Then what did you feel? Um, now before Graham answers, is there any one of you that can feel what Graham felt? Because this is something that all of you are capable of doing. Now be careful, the difference. there's a difference here between feeling what you feel <laughs> and feeling what Graham felt. And the problem is when we begin, obviously, it's hard for us to know the difference. It's like when I say something to you, you will feel that through the filter of your emotions. Right? So your emotions become this, this filter through which everything you hear from me is filtered. And like if, like if you're upset with men, everything I say to you about a woman, and you're a woman, is going to be put through that filter of you being upset with men. <coughs> that makes sense? Mm -hmm. And then you're going to judge what I'm saying to you, as if I'm being critical of women. Right? But that, that's not how I feel, it's how you feel through the filter of what's being said. So in Graham's case, his truth disagreed, so that's the first thing. So mm -hmm. we're I think What's the feeling that came up underneath that? I think the first thing that comes to my mind was that probably I wasn't feeling. Okay. I was thinking. Uh -huh. So why do you want to think? Mm, it's a hard habit to get rid of. It's a hard habit to get rid of, but there's a reason, an emotional reason why you want to think. What's that? What do you think it might be? <laughs> because you don't trust your feelings, isn't it? So, I cannot trust my feelings. Most people don't want to trust their emotions. They feel they can't. How many of you feel that you can't really trust emotions? That's why you've got to think a lot. No? Yeah, so it's a pretty common belief, isn't it? Emotions are indeterminate. Emotions are not logical. Emotions are... These are all the messages that we get, right? And the truth is that emotions that are damaging or are based on injuries obviously are not always logical right now in our life. But they were logical at some point in our life. That's the truth. 
So if you have an emotion right now where you're angry with men, it might not be very logical emotion right now because you might be married to a nice man, right? But at some point in your life that emotion was created, so it was logical then. But it needs to be felt in order for you to no longer carry it with you. So if you feel, this is a big issue for yourself, Graham, actually, if you think about it, because it's something that's come up quite a lot in our discussions together. I can't trust my feelings. My feelings are not able to be trusted, so I've got to think. I've got to be logical. I've got to work my way through this. Right? The truth is that you can trust your feelings, but when your feelings are connected with God's feelings, that's when you can trust your feelings. Now, of course, you're going to have to learn to trust your feelings even before then. Mm. Otherwise, you'll never get to the point where they're connected with God's feelings. So, you know what? Every one of us is going to have to do it sometime. Mm. Get used to being wrong. Mm. How many hate being wrong? <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrible feeling being wrong. What normally happens when you're wrong in this world? What happens? Yeah, dumped on, damned, condemned, trashed, judged, criticised. Right? Now, that is not what we want to do here. Right? You're allowed to be wrong. You've got free will. You're allowed to be wrong. That's one of the free things, the beauties of free will. You're allowed to be wrong. It's okay to be wrong. But often we don't believe it is because right from a young age, what were we taught? You get it right, boy, or else. Mm -hmm. right? Or girl. You get it right, or else. And what was the or else, generally? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what do we associate with getting things wrong? Pain. Pain, Pain. yeah. I'm, if I get something wrong, if I put up my hand right now and say something, AJ, and then I'm wrong, what's going to happen? I'm going to get punished in some way. How many of you feel that? Like, yeah. Oh, quite a few. So it's a common. These are common feelings. These are blockages to us being ourselves. Feeling lesser than too. Constantly, we're always taught that right from a young age, yeah. aren't we? I'm the adult. You're the child. You've got to listen to me. That's it. Why do? You, why do I have to do that, Mummy? Because I said so. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you as parents have said that? Oh, yes. <laughs> right. And and because of that, what happens? Well, <laughs> you saying so means nothing, really. But can you see how important it is to start addressing everything emotionally because of those kind of things? And to realise it's all okay. We can all be wrong. We're allowed to be wrong. We can all have painful emotions that we can talk about freely. We're allowed to be embarrassed. We're allowed to be ashamed. We're allowed to be, have these feelings and emotions that are in us. If you don't let yourself have those feelings and emotions, what is going to happen is you are going to shut down your emotional processing. Right? And if you shut down your emotional processing, what's going to happen then? Disconnect. You disconnect. You disconnect from yourself. You disconnect from oh God. God. You're never going to be at one with God. You're never going to be in a state of bliss. And that's what this intellectual stuff teaches you, which is a shame. Right. It's like that uh, logical song, Super Tramp. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you know, when I was young, it seemed that life was so wonderful, magical. But then they showed me a way where I could be sensible, dependable, logical. <laughs> and what happens? <laughs> and what happens? And the song says it really good. What happens is that he tuned out of himself, right? He, he's not himself anymore. And that's what's happened to all of you. All of you, now the construct that we have right in our minds, right at the moment, and this includes me, the construct we have right in our minds, right, right at the moment about ourselves, is actually a fantasy. It's all of these things that have been built up over time that have told us what we are. And now, we don't even know who we are anymore. Right? And this process of becoming at one with God will also help you to become at one with yourself so that you now know exactly who you are and what you really feel and what kinds of things you think inside of yourself and why you think them, what emotions are happening inside of here that cause those thoughts to bubble out of you. Hmm. <clears throat> 
So start trusting your feelings. Every time I get to the point I want to think about it, I'm now, there's an emotional reason why you want to think about it. Why do I want to focus on the fact that AJ said that, that dinosaurs you know, didn't eat meat? There's an emotional reason. There's always an emotional reason for everything I do. That's what I said yesterday, and I know many of you disagree. <laughs> but I'll say it at the end of the day. There's an emotional reason for everything you do. Mm. Everything. Yeah. Okay. Right away. Um, recently I've been doing two probably overloaded myself, but two different courses to do with going into your nations. Yep. One was the one that university, which I think you know a bit about. Yep. And one was the journey, do you know much about yep. the day? Yep. Both are so, are so different in that the journey, especially I'm nearly at the end of the practitioners, so we're getting deeper into the really causal, more emotions. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more painful mm -hmm. experiences we do. Yep. Whereas at the one this university, we definitely learn to go through, drop through, yep, into and the into feelings, bliss, mm -hmm. and the journey is the same. We keep dropping down through the layers mm -hmm. till you reach bliss. Yeah. And I got had the feeling that the journey was much more doing all that pain when you could do it. The one this university does it with the blessing yeah. much. <coughs> Easier is the way I'm putting it. Yeah. I don't know if it's easier. Yeah. And I had come to the conclusion that this is too, you don't need to be that cathartic. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me your opinion on being that cathartic going through the pain yeah. and not being quite so cathartic and getting to the same point? And is it necessary, etc.? Can I ask how your law of attraction has changed? I haven't had time really to breathe and know how it's <laughs> I feel that I've faced a lot of emotions and I'm growing, yep. definitely continually growing. Yep. And I really feel joyful about that. Yep. And I feel a lot more joy in my life. Yep. Um, I'm still, of course, attracting certain things, say my son and I will have a clash. Okay. So that hasn't, certain things haven't changed. Okay. Others have. Okay. Which is what is fairly normal for most emotional work that most people do. Mm -hmm. And my, my like, the, the opinion that I have is that you, God created you in such a way that everything that's inside of you can be worked through with God. Mm -hmm. As long as you have a desire to work through everything inside of yourself. The problem is with all different forms of emotional work is none of them address one issue, and that is... Do you really have a desire to work through certain issues inside of yourself? Now, get, let's look at the clash you have with your son. Mm -hmm. Obviously, even with all the emotional work that you've done, which is quite a lot by the sound of things, none of them have addressed this emotional issue that you have with your son. It hasn't addressed it, though we're both aware now that we do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's an awareness. Yeah. And we'll work on our own. We're both aware to take it back to ourselves, not to blame each other for the clash. How old is your son? 22. <coughs> and when you say you're both aware... We discuss it. Right. Yeah, we know that he owns his stuff and I own mine and we're on our own. But his stuff is mostly yours. Mm -hmm. Only me. <laughs> <laughs> This is a see. I suppose what I'm, I'll just address that a little yeah. later. Yeah. What I'm saying is that what we can do with a lot of our emotional work is that we we only focus on the issues that are the least painful for us generally, even though we do go through quite a lot of pain. What I'm saying to you on the divine path is you are going to be, if you want to be at one with God, you are going to go through every single issue that you ever got, every single one. Now, you can, if you want, use any technique possible, anything that's out there to help you connect with your emotions. 
So you can do the Brandon Bay's journey. You can be, you do the oneness blessing. If it connects you with emotion, do it. If you, if you like massage and that connects you with emotion, do that. If you do, you know, do all of these different things. They're all fine. <clears throat> but have the focus that in the end, I am going to work on everything within me and I'm going to notice my law of attraction as it currently is. Mm -hmm. right? Now, the truth is that as you work through these different emotions using all these different techniques, many of which are very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. So no, I'm not going to decry anything that helps you work through an emotion. I am certainly going to have statements about things that cause you to get back into your mind. Yeah. Right? But anything that helps you stay connected with your emotion is going to be a good thing for you. And while it works for you, do it. So right? it doesn't matter which one, is, if that one's a bit simpler. But what, there is something going on inside of yourself, though, at, at the same time. If, and if you can feel this emotion, mm -hmm. you have this feeling inside of yourself that the Brandon Bay's journey at times has become so painful that you would have liked to have avoided some of it. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. And that's what causes you to actually then favour mm -hmm. the yeah. oneness blessing, yeah. the Diksha. Yeah. Right? Now, that in itself is a dangerous proposition that you've set up within yourself emotionally. Mm -hmm. Because if you favour anything over the other, what are you actually doing? You're Running avoiding away. an emotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well you have made me question that yesterday mm -hmm. and I was starting to think Oneness University <laughs> yeah, yeah. before that. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm not saying that either has any thing over the other. What I'm saying is as soon as you make a choice to be selective you are actually making a choice to avoid something and, and have a preference of one thing over another. When you're at one with God, you won't do that. Mm -hmm. So if, if to be at one with God, you're not going to do that, then why develop that now within yourself? Why not just accept, this has come into my lap, my law of attraction has brought Brandon Bay's journey. Let's go and do it. My law of attraction has now brought Deeksha Oneness Blessing. Let's go and do that. Mm -hmm. My law of attraction has now brought... You know, this AJ guy is speaking to me. Let's go and do that. Mm -hmm. right? Your law of attraction is helping you work your way through which, what is our minefield, if you like, of emotions. Mm -hmm. And, and it, you need to trust that and go with that. But don't judge one over the other. Don't go down, down and select one and say, that was easier on me, so I like that. I'm going to stick with that. Yeah. And you know, in a way, that's what every person in every religion does, isn't it? Oh, that religion's easier on me than the other one, so I'm going to stick with that. Mm -hmm. Or that, well, isn't it the same with every philosophy of life generally? Oh, that's easier on me, so I'm going to stick with that. I'm not saying this is going to be easy on you. It's not going to be easy on you. It's going to be real. And that isn't the same thing. I think I just got it. His stuff's mainly mine because he's my son. Of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. So you even saying to him, you deal with your stuff, I'll deal with mine, is actually very unfair to him. Can you see that? In reality, what we need to say as parents is, I need to deal with all my stuff, and when I do that, everything between us will change. Mm. At any age. At any age. At any age. Yeah. And some of you have already experienced that. When you've, like, however, you've experienced that with your son a bit, haven't you? As soon as you made some instant changes, how old is your son? 20, 30? 42. 42. Straight away, different relationship. I do believe that and why I'm working on myself. Yeah. That's made me understand it even clearer. Yeah. I guess what you said about your children taking no. on your. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So remember that with particularly our relationship with our children, our children are the best possible trigger. Like, I can't trigger you as much as your children can trigger you. Yeah. Right? Your, trigger is, your triggers are your children. Any, any problems in those relationships you have with your children, you need to look at yourself, not at the child. It's not the child, it's you that created this. Remember? I'm responsible for everything. <laughs> Most parents don't like hearing that, right? I'm responsible for everything inside of myself. Yeah. Everything that I'm creating around me is my responsibility. I need to look at that. That's what I need to address. Any problem in any relationship <laughs> around me, I've got to address something within me because it's my law of attraction. Without blame. Without blame, yeah. And even without blame of, of myself. <laughs> right? I just need to say, hey, this is just an emotion. 
inside of me that got inside of me, who knows how, and does it really matter? Doesn't it just matter to get it back out again? In there? That's really all that matters. So do that. A follow on question. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about um, techniques such as TFT and EFT, the, the yep. tapping techniques. Yep. Yep. And, um, I also saw a man up in uh, Montville who did, he did the tapping, but also you, you say a statement that contains a lot of stuff in it, and he taps it out of you. Yep. And, um, and metaphysical neurology, which is something that. Um, I think you met the yep. person who teaches yoga. Yep. Do those, um, I'm just wondering whether those actually, what I sort of feel is that I'm, in doing those, I'm kind of avoiding the emotion. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I'm dissipating them without feeling them. Mm -hmm. And is this helpful? <clears throat> it really gets down to that <clears throat> yeah. inside, what's happening inside of you, what's your intent? You can use any, remember I just said this, you can use any technique you want as long as you intend to connect to your deep emotional causal reasons as to why you feel the way you feel. You can use exactly the same techniques in many cases to detune from the emotion as well. So it just depends on what your intent is. So what is your intent? Is your intent to connect and feel or is your real intent to want an easier way? I want an easier way than what AJ is suggesting to me, which is, and all I'm suggesting to you is, you're going to need to experience the emotion you froze in time at the time you didn't experience it. That's all I'm suggesting to you, right? You're going to need to experience that emotion now. So if it was one year old, you're going to feel one year old. <coughs> and you're going to feel that emotion that you tried to shut down, or in most cases, your parents or your environment shut down in you, at that age, right? So what is your intent? Is your intent to have an easy way tapping yourself out of the emotion or is your intent to tap yourself into that emotion? What's your intent? Now, most people's intent is to get themselves out of the way. Yeah, get themselves out of the emotion. Why do most people use meditation? For the same reason. Right? Most people have to meditate every day. Do you think if you're at one with God, you'll meditate every day? Why would you need to? You're in a constant state of bliss. You're not, you're not going to be meditating every day, are you? You're just going to be enjoying whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it, however you want to do it, all the time. And you're not going to need to have an hour or two of meditation in the morning to get yourself started with it. Right? That's not how it's going to be when you're at one with God. Is there anyone at one with God? On earth? No. <laughs> so in the meantime, you can use a little bit of meditation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you're sincere, but what is your intent? Why are you using this meditation? Because I feel closer to God. I feel closer to God. Do you? Absolutely. Without doubt, no exception at all times. <laughs> 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 yes. How can I be closer to God when I'm further away from myself? Well, if we're talking about the head self, the mind, it's the intention of meditation. That's not yourself. It's to get out of mind. Yeah, but, but what's yourself? What did I say your soul is? Your emotions, emotions. your passions, your desires, your longings. Yeah. Right? Now, if you're using, and I'm, if you're using meditation right, to get away from emotions, to make yourself feel calmer, then you are actually getting away from yourself. How can you be closer to God if you're less so, further so away from yourself? So how about feelings of trust there? You know, I asked you before the lecture, AJ, and you said, learn to trust your feelings. And the feelings I have after meditation are the ones I can trust. And there is a, a loveliness and a lovingness. Okay. And Let me ask you one other question then. Truly. I, I say it because I... Why aren't you in that state permanently? Why aren't I in that mm. state permanently? Mm. Uh, 
Why aren't you in the state of trusting permanently? I don't have an answer. I don't understand the question. Does everyone else understand yeah. what I'm asking? Yeah. What do you feel? She hasn't dealt with my question. No. What causes me to mistrust? It's the one time that I feel real, that the only thing is real. Yeah. And myself. I know. That after that. All of the reasons you're giving me are reasons why people have become, on the spiritual path, have become so addicted to meditation. <coughs> but it's after and it's <coughs> being addicted to toxic thoughts. Or, I, I understand. Or, no. It's what, better than. You know, our most powerful addictions are the ones that are good. The ones that are, yeah. feel good, right? Yes. Like, who's addicted to sex, right? <laughs> <laughs> So who's going to put their hand up now? It's only me again. <laughs> but, but see, you've become addicted to meditation. And the reason why you've become addicted to meditation is because it does take you away some co from core emotions that need to be felt and released. And then you won't need any of these addictions at all. You will not need to meditate every day. In fact, you won't even need a day where you feel you need to meditate to connect to God. Now, I'm not saying don't meditate and don't connect to God using meditation, if that's what you want to do. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, what you are currently doing is avoiding some emotions of mistrust that you have of God. Okay. And you only feel trust with God when you meditate. And pray. I, I include the whole thing, yeah. the whole caboose, not just... I understand. You know, and yeah. there are times when you have some deep mistrust issues with God, and those emotions, mm. if you deal with them, will actually cause you to be permanently connected with God, and you won't need meditation then. You won't need, in the end, any tools. tools. In the end, yeah. but we're not the end yet. We're at the beginning. That's so, the problem. So, the, the reason why we children. search for tools is because we want to avoid the emotions. <coughs> the reason why I need a tool is because I want to avoid. I want to feel to good. We use the tool, the brain, the tool that we use to make reasonable, practical decisions in everyday living. We use I don't. the carpenter uses, but you're, you know. No, but, but honestly, every celestial spirit does it, so why do you want to keep doing it? Why do you want to keep doing that? I'm saying, here's our soul, right? There's our soul, feminine soul for yourself. Here's your spirit form, right? Here's your material form. What bit do you want to develop? What's the real you? That's the real me. That's the bit you want to develop. And how do you want to develop it? Do you want to develop it natural love? Because natural love is fine if that's what you want. And what you're doing is developing it natural love, and that's fine. But it is not going to be anything that's going to result in atonement with God if you avoid, if you use your tools to avoid an emotion. That's what I'm saying. But how about using the tool to feel love? Look, I know when I feel love and lovingness. Yeah. yeah. That's fine. I, I know it. But, but you <coughs> know also that you can become so addicted to that feeling of love mm. that you then avoid all the emotions that you feel that, that are outside of that. Mm. So I'm saying don't avoid anything, including the love. Mm. <laughs> you follow me? But what you're doing is you're trying to select the good emotions and not feel the bad ones. Mm. Right? And that feel, is not, feel, feel. and that's not going to get you at one with God. What it's going to do is get you to the sixth fear of your progression, and you're going to feel good doing that because you're only selecting all the good emotions, and all the bad ones you'll finish up ignoring. What I'm saying is, get rid of all the bad baggage by experiencing it, and then you'll experience everything as it happens, and that is. Painful or pleasurable, you experience everything. Remember what I said humility was. Humility was the desire to feel every emotion within me, including painful and pleasurable. As soon as I use a tool to avoid a pain, what am I doing? I am now only selecting pleasurable emotions. Am I in a state of humility now? No. No? If you're not in a state of humility, you are never going to be at one with God. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying to throw away these things that you've done. What I, and I've said this quite clearly, have I not? What I'm saying is, if you use a tool to avoid, if that is your intent, then you are not going to be at one with God doing that. That's what I'm saying. And you need, all of you, including me when I say this, need to be in a state where we're willing to accept all of our emotions, not just feel-good emotions. Mm -hmm. Now, on these spiritual paths that are all being presented to you today, what are they all doing? Most of them are presenting the feel-good emotions, are they not? Mm -hmm. Concentrate on the feel-good emotions, do all the feel-good stuff. You know, do the crystal work, do this work, do that work, all the metaphysical things to make mm -hmm. yourself feel good, get the massages you want, and all these different things that make you feel good. But all that's doing is it's developing one half of you, mm -hmm. and it's leaving behind this other half which feels bad. Mm -hmm. And in the end, you're still going to be carrying around the bags. It's a bit like picking up a bag of rocks, mm -hmm. carrying it around in your shoulders and making out it's not there. <laughs> That's what we're doing when we're carrying around these emotions all the time. It's tiring. It's going to be tiring, and eventually it will be tiring. And six fear spirits in the spirit world who are in a really good condition of natural love are still carrying around bags of emotions that they have neglected to actually be truthful about in their life. And you can get to that state too, if you want. You can use all these intellectual techniques. No worries, you can use them. And every technique out there that's there that's not dealing with an emotion or that's making you feel good rather than just making you feel is going to detune you from your relationship with God. Okay. So, so how do we manage with the three levels there? On that purely physical, day-to-day, -day, managing life, getting through all the stuff level. Yep. Part of these, the idea of these tools is to help us manage that, yeah. so we can we can get done what we need to do and be effective. So okay, so how do you manage the, the you word you said was manage, right? Oh yeah. Well, let's call it. So we call it control that yeah. as well. Manage and control. Survival. Okay, survival and all that stuff. Do you think the soul cares about any of that? No. Why? Because the soul already knows. You already know that there's nothing to manage. You already know at the soul level, right? This is something God implanted into you. You already know at the soul level, there's nothing to manage. There is no such thing as survival. There is no such thing as this, because when this soul develops, everything that you need just comes to you. Mm. Everything. Any food you need, clothes you need, shelter you need, money you need, anything you need is just going to come to you. So what we do is, because it's not coming to me, I decide... Oh, it's not coming to me, so now I'm going to have to manage and control it so that it does come to me. Mm. What I'm saying is, don't do that. I'm saying, feel the soul's emotions so, and release the ones that cause it to not come to you. And when you've released all of that, all of these things will automatically come to you without you having to think and manage and control. Do you follow me? Yes. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Now, obviously, there's a changeover period from doing that, right, doing it one way, managing and controlling, into doing it the other way, and during that period is going to be huge change for you. You're going to go from a, cha from, from a place of trusting yourself to manage and control everything in your life to trusting that God will bring you everything you need. Right? And I'm not saying you're not going to have to work, but of course you're going to have to work, because one of the things you'll learn in your soul is... I need to care for myself. And of course you're going to start caring for yourself. One of the things that you will learn is to do that. right? Completely at the soul level. When you do that, you will realise that actually this body doesn't even need clothes. This body doesn't even need food. Because the soul can provide everything it needs. And when you're at one with God, that's how you'll feel. Now you might put on clothes for other people's benefit, right? <laughs> but that's how you'll feel. So, when we manage and control, what we're really doing, in a way, is we are still using the tools to mm -hmm. avoid the soul's reasons why it's creating the need for us to manage and control. The only reason why we need to manage and control is because there's some emotions in our soul that don't 
that cause all of these things to be pushed away from us that we need. You follow me? Mm -hmm. There's some emotions in my soul right at the moment of unworthiness. It pushes away my need for you know, money. That's what it does. One of the things it does. It pushes away my need for cash. <clears throat> right? Now, why do I even need cash? Well, in a universe down the track, in our universe down the track, there won't be any need for it. But right now, I agree. You know, to live in this world, you're going to need to have some of this unless you're self-sufficient. So, my soul is not bringing in that need. Why isn't it? It's not because I'm not working or not doing this or not doing that good enough. It's because I'm blocking it from my soul. I have an emotion in my soul that I'm not dealing with about unworthiness. Me. Because I release that emotion, once I release that emotion, all of a sudden, everything that this body needs will all be provided for. God provides everything. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that this can happen to us here on earth? Of course. Like really <coughs> yep. So could you give us an example? Not, not a person my age who's eligible for a pension, but someone who hasn't got any way of putting food on the table except for that what you're calling is unnecessary. How is the soul going to resolve that? Just as an example. Uh, I'll give you an example from my own life from the first century. You want to, is that all right? It was a much harsher environment than now, right, to earn, to earn money to survive. But I was taught to work, just like all of you have been taught to work by my father, right? And I became a builder like my father was. But then in my 20s, I realised that, hang on a sec, God actually will provide everything. As long as I work through the emotional reasons why that's not happening. And so what I began to do then was just trust God rather than trust myself to do everything. As long as I stayed in my emotional processing, my emotional truth, my emotional work. All through the three and a half years that I went around the public ministry that's recorded in the Bible, there was not a single time when I actually worked in order to get money, in order to buy food. Mm -hmm. Now, I worked many times, but I did it because I wanted to do some work. But I didn't do it in order to get something. And all through that time, I just got given things, mm -hmm. one after the other after the other. Everything I needed, clothes, food, shelter, everything. Wouldn't work so well nowadays, though, would it? Why not? Well, supposing you, 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 your living environment requires you to have a car. Well, then I'll, I'll be given one. Mm. Mm. I, mean, I, I find everybody's got their own different levels. I can get by on a shoestring mm. and not have big needs. And I hate seeing other people... I've got huge things. needs. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just joking. But I, like, honestly, what's the problem with having big needs? There's no problem, really. In the end, your soul's desire will create everything you need. In the future, you will see this in operation, right? in terms of an, in an abundant state, what you can do. What I'm saying is right now, the only reason why it's not happening right now is because there's an emotion inside of me, inside of you, that causes it to not happen. That's the only reason. Right? And once you deal with those emotions, your attractions will be different. The thing is, at the moment, you don't trust what I'm saying. And that's okay. You don't have to. You follow me? No, you don't. I can feel you, though. I mean, we want to. I know. We want to want to. And this is, the, this is the thing about what you're hearing, right? Is that it, you can feel it tugging on your soul, right? You can think, you can feel it saying, wow, wouldn't life be fantastic like that? Can, you can feel that, can't you? Right? Wouldn't life... But it's just a utopian dream, AJ. What are you coming up with, right? That's the other thing that also goes in there. Why does that come in there? Because fear, yes. doubt. fear doubt, and all these things around disharmony with love that I need to feel and release from me. That's why they're not happening. That's why they don't happen. No? AJ, I was actually, I've actually been fortunate enough to meet someone that's, that's done that. Yeah. Um, he was, yeah, two million bucks in the bank. Um, had an experience yeah. um, and gave it all away. Yeah. And he still travels around and does. He he knows 
and he said, it was whatever I need mm. will come to me. Yeah. He said, if I, want a heli if I need a helicopter ride, I'll walk down the street and yeah. I'll find one. Yeah. And he's just, yeah, so I've, I have met someone else that has mm. sort of um, done that. It's yeah. just magnificent. Yeah, it is magnificent. And all of you are totally capable. Mm. Is it, is it a sign that we're on the way when some unexpected things do just fall into place? But you didn't, you didn't plan on them? Well, it's a sign that you're trusting yourself, certainly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because certainly. I, don't, I don't pay any attention to finances anymore at all. Mm -hmm. But I just trust it's all going to happen. And all the news on the television would tell you that you can't live on the pension. Mm -hmm. But I find no trouble whatsoever in living on a pension, but mm -hmm. I don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. And the other day I went to the mail expecting, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> passport. 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 Yeah. passport. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I got in the mail yeah. that I did not expect, and I still don't know why they paid it to me, yeah. and that there's been some corporate affairs blending and dispersing of funds or something or the other, yeah. and it wasn't from any big investment or anything, it was yeah. just a health um, or security, what do you call it? So it happens, does it? <laughs> so AJ, that happens. Is it because she does not hold a great, um, a great draw to getting money? Mm. She's just let it go. That's right. Whenever, you, see, if I had a whole, a very strong draw to getting money, mm. what will happen then is I will get lots and lots of triggers to deal with the underlying emotion yeah. driving that. That's stopping Which you. means that I won't get any money, mm. and I'll be triggered. I'll mm. be, yeah, there'll be some emotions coming up as mm. a result of that, due to the law of attraction. Do I want to feel those emotions? That's the key. A lot of us don't. So what we do then is we go down this road of yeah. managing and controlling so that we can get it. And so, while that might sound all very practical and everything, it's actually the least practical thing you can do with your life. The most practical thing you can do with your life is to actually feel every emotion in your soul. That is the most practical and logical thing to do with your life. Right? And this is the same message I've been teaching for 2,000 years, by the way. <laughs> that dealing with that is the most practical and logical thing you can do with. It's the truth that sets you free. Mm. And I, I don't, I'm not just talking about emotional freedom or some spiritual hairy-fairy thing, you know, when it comes to freedom. What I'm talking about is complete freedom. Complete freedom for you to do exactly what you want, when you want to, in the state of love. And it's by being in that state that you finish up being totally free. That is the most practical, and intelligent and logical thing you can do with your life. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. So, AJ, on that line, I've got a huge debt coming up for a million to be replaced. If I just don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm not encouraging you to don't worry about it because the truth is that you are worried about it. What I'm, what I'm encouraging you is to go into the trigger. The trigger is this huge debt, 1.1 million or whatever it is, huge debt, right? The truth is, go into that emotion. What are you feeling? You're feeling like you're being hemmed in, controlled. You're feeling like everything's going to get so tough. You're feeling like really in a panicky situation, really frightened. Go into those feelings and feel them. Don't ignore them. It's those feelings that are creating the situation. And when you release those feelings by connecting to them and experiencing them, the situation will disappear too. You follow me? Yeah. I'm still working through one similar and um, with the property settlement, it still hasn't happened. It's right, got yeah. all these stallings all the time. Yeah. But when I started connecting with the fear of having being destitute, Mm. As the word you told me, you know, I really connected with the word destitution, and yeah. it was it went right back to my parents when they first came to Australia yeah. as new Australians, and they had nothing, yeah. and their fear, Mum's mm. fear, particularly while she's carrying me, all mm -hmm. her fears of unworthiness and destitution, and um, if something happened to Dad, she'd have nothing. She couldn't speak the language, didn't have yeah. transport. Yeah. I connected with all those feelings. Yeah. I'm not through it yet, but. Yeah. 
I was really amazed how deep the rabbit hole went yeah. and, I, and, and I, I could feel that as a fetus of yeah. mum's fears. Yeah. So I'm still working through stuff with it, yeah. but it's not as bad as it was when I originally used to just freeze. Well, well I remember our of, first conversations, you used to go straight into panic, oh, you? straight into panic. Freeze, yeah. just freeze of fear, can't breathe. But yeah. now it's um, there's an awareness of where it's all coming from. Yeah. and. And, the lot, and, and unworthiness issues are in there, mixed in as well. It's quite yeah. a big swirl of not feeling worthy and deserving for myself as yeah. well. Yeah. Which again originated with my parents as well, because yeah. mum and dad were going through big stuff when I, while she was carrying me. Yeah. But, you know, back in Australia, back in the early 50s, and they came out with one suitcase, yeah. didn't own a spoon. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, I can, I'm connected with that. It was yeah, just amazing. So once you get to the root of one particular mm -hmm. unworthiness, mm -hmm. that's the base of all the directions of unworthiness that come up. Yes, but it's a bit like. Or do you need to? Yeah, it's go a bit, through each one. It's a bit like a tree that's grown. You see, it's a, a lot of your emotions are very core emotions from childhood. If you can imagine your sort of childhood emotion like, like the roots of your tree. And then this trunk grew, and then after this trunk grew all these branches. Mm. And all these branches were all the different things that have happened in your life and that you've done in your life and what have happened to you as a result of those core emotions that have now created even more emotions that we've often locked up within ourselves. So we've got this whole structure now that we need to deconstruct to get back to the, to the roots. Mm. And, and it's really in a lot of ways like that with your emotions. You need to be able to get back through these chains that have been there back into these emotions. So the best way to do that is to feel what happened today. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying to people, oh, sit down, start making lists of all the things you know about childhood that upset you. Although well, you can do that. What I'm saying is sit down today and what's the feeling that comes up? What's the feeling that you felt today? Right now, what was the feeling you're feeling? Right? Go into that feeling, because that's the feeling the Law of Attraction is bringing to you right now. That's the one you're ready to deal with right now. Deal with that right now. Go into it, experience it now. And then after that one's done, another one will come up. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And then another one will come up and so forth. And eventually you'll follow this train down mm -hmm. to be the core emotions. Now, of course, you, there are things you can pass actively do too to help you access those things, and I'll talk about those practical things that you can do in a minute. Yeah, yeah AJ, to understand your emotions when you go into them, and then you find out your emotion and the reason, to actually let it go, is that because you understand why it happened? Um, I'll talk about a few things about letting an emotion go. Firstly, experiencing the emotion is letting it go. Secondly, a lot of times associated with the experience of emotion is the need to also experience the new truth. So, so you could say, that, remember, here's our soul. Has everyone seen what that colour is? It's probably not very bright, is it? Here's our soul, right? That's not much better, right? <laughs> It's a real interesting song. This is. <laughs> yeah. Rainbow song. The red worked really well yesterday. Yeah. The red worked well? Yeah. Which red? It's on the, the red. It's on the board. board. Oh, it's on the board. Yeah. yeah. Right. So our soul is passions. Desire. Passions. Desires. What else? Emotions. Emotions. Aspirations. Aspirations. <clears throat> Memories. Memories. Okay, etc. It's two influences on our soul. Truth and no. error. error. I'm not saying love is an influence on our soul. Love is a, an emotion. I'm saying that truth and error is what influences and enters us emotionally. Right? Now, love is a truth-based emotion. Right? Hatred is an error-based emotion. You follow me? Fear is an error-based emotion. Wisdom is a truth-based emotion. Right? So there's all these different emotions. Now, the trouble with all of these emotions is they enter you emotionally. They're not thoughts. They are feelings inside of you. They're feelings that you feel. 
So let's say when I'm one year of age, I'm screaming my lungs out because of something just happened to me, mm -hmm. and my mother or fa and father just leave me be mm -hmm. and they don't even hold me. Mm -hmm. What's my emotion? I'm, I'm unloved, loved, abandoned. abandoned. <laughs> Now that emotion enters me mm. as a belief that I believe is true. Mm. I am abandoned. Rejected. Rejected. No, no good. Right. I'm not worthy even to be picked up, right? Yeah. Now, these are not thoughts. No. Because at one, how, how many really combined thoughts and clar clarified thoughts do we have? Very few, right? We have these feelings that we're coming. And the feelings often came from our parents. They were purposefully rejecting us. Or they were purposefully abandoning us in their mind to teach us a lesson. Or in their mind, do you know what I mean? To, to teach us something. But in the end, we, we feel those emotions. They entered our soul and they became our truth. Do you know what I mean by that? They became what we now believe to be the truth about ourselves. And then, from that moment, we began acting upon them. We began believing them to be true, of course, because they were the truth of that moment. We were abandoned, we were rejected, we were left alone. Right, right at that moment. It was the truth then. So, this truth entered us, but now it's, it's become error. In the sense that now... It's staying within us and it guides every single thing we do. Every single thing that happens to me is attracted to me because I have these feelings in me. So, what kind of a relation do, do I attract? I attract relationships where I'm going to get rejected. Yeah. Because I have a feeling inside of myself of rejection <coughs> that I don't want to feel. And because I don't want to feel it, I am now going to be putting it out there to the universe, right? That's the law of attraction at work. And the law of attraction now, this emotion of rejection, reject me, reject me, reject me, reject me, goes out to the universe. And you know what? You'll have a great big long line of people, and if you're a woman, a great big long line of men who are going to reject you in a relationship, lining up at your door. <coughs> And you'll say, men are mongrels, men are mongrels. <laughs> like, this is the fifth man that's rejected me, right? But what is they? We're still holding on to it. We're still holding on to this emotion of <coughs> rejection. <coughs> and we, can't, we don't need to condemn ourselves or judge ourselves for it. It happened in, in a truthful environment. It, happened, it, it really happened to us at some point in our life where we were rejected. We were abandoned. Right? But now it's come to define our life. So quite often when I'm talking to people, I'm saying to them, you have this emotion or that emotion, and they feel that that's a judgment straight away. But if you could liken it like this, imagine your soul is a nice crystal ball, nice and clear. If you imagine just a big crystal ball, you see straight through it, beautiful, all light flows through and is reflected by it. Imagine that. And then imagine someone comes along and throws a heap of mud at it. Right? Mm. What light gets through it now? Very, very little. Now, you need to decide that you're going to wash off the mud. You have control of that. It is your soul. It is your free will. Right? No one else can do that for you. Even the people who threw the mud at you can't take that mud off of you now. Right? You need to decide to do it. Because it's entered you as emotions in the soul that you now to believe to be truth. And that's where you're going to need courage to actually allow yourself now to experience those emotions that you locked up inside of yourself, which has become the mud that defines your life. Yeah? And when you do that, what will happen then is that you'll have the ability to feel all of your own emotions without being afraid of any of them. Mm -hmm. And when you can do that, you can feel God's emotions without being afraid of any of them either. And then you have the ability to grow and become a one with God using that technique. Right? But if you decide that this mud defines you, you're going to become very attached to that mud. 
Yeah? And so when, I, when somebody says to you, oh, you know, Peter, you've got this little issue, you know, where, where you know, you're not very emotionally sort of connected with people. And what I do is say, hang on a sec, what's, he's talking about me, right? <laughs> he's talking about me, and how, how, you know, how dare he do that? And what do we do then? Is we go ahead and just defend the castle that we've created. Don't we? And so every single thing that comes across for it, law of attraction, every man that comes into my life in this case, rejects me. So what do I do? Every new man I'm really suspicious of now. Right? He's going to reject me. He's going to re I'm looking for times when he's going to reject me now, right? Aren't I? Because... I am so now suspicious and so guided by trying to prevent this that I am actually now in the state where I'm trying to intellectually determine whether somebody's going to direct it, reject me. And you know what? The truth is, yes, he's going to reject you because of that emotion in you. That's the only reason why. Yeah? So is it then important to get back to the very first time that that belief came into your mind is that because if you're one or maybe if you're only three months old for instance that happened and you're working through trying to work through those issues is it important to actually know what instance that actually happened I mean, firstly the belief did not enter your mind <coughs> right Sorry. the belief the belief was an emotion that entered your soul mm -hmm. so firstly get that now if that's the case then the mind is really unnecessary, isn't it, in this process? Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. Because the belief, the feeling, yeah, the emotion is in your soul. Yeah. So you will need to feel that emotion in the soul. You won't need to think how it got there. You won't need to know even the occasion it got there. But most of the time, the memory, which is in your soul, will probably appear to you when you allow yourself to feel the emotion. So, like, like Gloria mentioned earlier, that she actually traced some things back and she could feel these feelings that came from, from when she was in mum's womb even. Now, obviously, she didn't have any thoughts at that stage. They were just feelings hitting her. And allowing yourself to feel the feelings, you'll know the source. Is it also important, um, does one, is, it, is it important to be able to, to name the emotion? Because it, sometimes the emotion is just... Right. A, it's just a feeling, and it's, is it important to say, well, now, what is this feeling? You know what I mean? <laughs> and our desire to name an emotion generally comes from our intellect wanting to understand. However, when we begin, knowing the emotion can sometimes be very helpful for us to connect with it emotionally. So my suggestion is, do whatever is going to help you feel the emotion. So if naming it helps you feel it, go ahead and name it. Mm -hmm. okay. Right? So if you can naming it actually... Um Blanket it too? Oh, certainly. Can. I can say, yeah, I felt uh, you know, unworthy then. Mm. Well, that's great. I've acknowledged that I felt unworthy, but mm. has it done anything yet? No, because I still have the unworthy emotion, the unworthy mm. feeling is inside of my soul. It's not going to come out until I, until I experience it, until I feel it. Why do I always want to explain to the tenth rule of yeah, I know. I'm a parent. <laughs> and I wanted to do that at some point. I remember the first time I uh, said to my father, I said, uh, Dad, now that I understand my soul, and I understand the souls of my children, I understand how bad a parent I've been. And you know what he did? He yelled and screamed at me for nearly a half an hour about that. Do you know why? You made him feel bad. Because he'd always felt that I was a good parent. And so what is he now doing? Feeling bad. He's now feeling, he re must have been a really bad parent. Mm. And he didn't want to feel that emotion. Mm. But the truth is that every single emotion inside of your children was created <coughs> primarily by the people around your children. Which are mostly parents. you, your parents, the parents. That is the truth. I'm not saying it to judge you. The same happened to you. Exactly the same happened to you. And one of the main reasons why you will shut down your own emotion is because you want to believe your parents were good. 
and you'll shut down your own emotion because of that. You'll want to shut it down and keep it under control and tell yourself that you, your parents did a great job, they were doing the best they could and everything else, but it's all just a denial of truth. And if you want to feel emotion, you are going to need to be very focused on being really, really truthful with yourself. Really truthful. You're going to need to come to, what did I say, the second thing on the board yesterday? Can you remember right at the start? Pray for divine truth. What did I mean by that? I said you're going to have to come to have a passionate desire for God's truth, for the way God sees things entering you. Every single emotion that was created in disharmony with God's love, God sees has entered you. And he sees its source. He sees where it came from. And he sees the majority of it came from your parents, whether they knew it or not. And the same applies to your own children. The majority of it came from you, whether you knew it or not. The key now is to not judge that. The key is to do something about that. Right? So while I understand your feeling of like wanting to defend, and I understand that completely, and in the end all we're doing is defending falsehood. And the key is to try to get into the state of always being in truth. You're damning everything. Well, I've long ago got, got trying to understand what God's up to, but what is he creating this cascade of awful characters to create more awful characters? God never created the cascade of awful parenting. It came from the first human couple beginning this process of self-reliance. Yes. We talked about that yesterday, remember? Yeah, for those that were here. Everything that within is in us now came from this process of being self-reliant. And honestly, um, I know the feeling that many of you have is that I'm damning everything. I'm just telling the truth how it is about everything is the way I see it. Now, you don't have to agree with it, and I'm not asking you to. That's why I give my time for free. You don't have to accept anything that I'm saying. All you need to remember, though, is if you want to connect to God, and this is something that I'm saying as a categoric truth, you are going to have to accept the truth as God sees it. So have the first couple not done that? They have now. So then... But they've done it in the spirit world. Filter it down? Well, they can't filter it down because it, it, the energies come... Yeah, it, it was already, by the time they'd done it, already nearly 100,000 years had passed. So, by the time they actually the became... Sorry? What was the question? Um, was the first human couple, um, have they cleared away their original emotions that caused all this error? And the answer I've given is yes, they have, but they did it in the spirit world nearly 100,000 years after they were living on Earth. And obviously there's been a lot of damage created from, from that mm. original choice. As we clear our emotions in us, are they cleared in our children? And you will see instant changes in your children, particularly if they're very young. But you'll see them even if they're old. However, as their age grows into a place of where they're using their own free will, the effect on them won't be as great as it will be if they're young children. Right? So, mm. so, for example, if a child's three years of age and you begin working through your emotions, what will happen is your child will automatically start changing and you'll see those changes. Mm. If your child is 15 and got a fair bit of their own free will mixed in with the process, then it might not be as easy for them to deal with their emotions. Because now it depends a bit on their willingness to feel their own emotions. Yeah. Can I just add to that? Yeah. With my grandchildren, I have um, an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. They see right through me. It's like I'm transparent as glass. Mm -hmm. they, could, they could tell when I was being false and hiding my emotions behind a smile. Mm -hmm. And as I've been processing, um, they can tell when I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. And they just respond with more love, more kisses, more wanting to play, come and walk with me. Yeah. Before I was a lot more needy, wanting their love, so I do things and they could feel it wasn't a connection. Mm, yeah. But when I do the connection with them now, I mean, I've still got a long way to go, but um, mm. I feel the difference in them. They sense the difference in me and they respond to the difference in me. And it's really awesome. There's just no word to describe it, really. Mm. Mm. They, children are the most sensitive mm. 
But obviously they are they have the least amount of damage, right? Mm -hmm. Least amount of soil damage. So they are very sensitive to any change you make. And this includes children, grandchildren even. Mm -hmm. Any any change you make, they are very, very sensitive to. Yeah. I just feel that um, I've kind of open up to my emotions. I can't recognize you. You said just a little while ago, what are you feeling right now? And for me, it was just a complete blank. And I know that, that um, for years and years and years, ever since I've been thinking about emotions and things, I know I shut down. Um, I've kept everything on a nice, even plane. Mm. Don't go up, don't go down. Don't have ups, don't, don't have downs. Don't, mm. yep. If you were uh, a child, if you cry, I'll give you something to cry for. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, um, Can I say to you, mm. firstly, that where you are is exactly where mm. I was 12 years ago. Mm. I was asked by a psychologist that I went to visit because I was so detuned from my own emotions. What I would feel if somebody came in and murdered my boys in front of my eyes and then went again. And I said to him, I don't know. And I didn't know what I would feel. Now I know what I would feel. But then I didn't know. And I was very, very detuned from my emotions. Very detuned. Not detuned from other people's emotions. I knew exactly what theirs were. But my own, very detuned from it. Yeah. And maybe what I could talk about now perhaps is some tools that I had to use to start, some practical things I had to do to start getting myself in contact with my emotions. Yeah. Does, that, does that sound mm -hmm. alright? Yeah. And, and then maybe we can share some practical things that you've been able to do as well and so forth. Alright. Well, <clears throat> One of the first decisions I made in, when I realised that I didn't know what I felt was that I had to make a list of every single thing I was afraid of. Huh? So that's probably my number one suggestion. List every fear. If you want to, my suggestion is get a journal. I, I just get a notebook. So this is my notebook that I carry with me at the moment. I've had hundreds of these over the last <laughs> so many years. And I'll read you bits from it um, a, a little later. Um, but one of the things I had to do right at the start was I listed every single fear. And then I also sat down with myself and decided to list how I would feel if I was at one with God. In other words, what I believed God would feel about those particular things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What would be an example? <coughs> now, I say may feel because I don't know how God feels really at the time. I didn't even know how I felt, so it was very difficult. But let's say, let's say one of the fears I had. One of the fears I had was um, I was afraid that I would lose my family and friends if I decided to be emotional. So in other words, I thought that my family and my friends would all just leave. Yeah, they'd wipe me off. And ironically, that's exactly what happened, by the way. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I just um, left my first marriage and was totally ostracised <coughs> by all my friends and family. Yeah. There was only one person who supported me. Yeah. Yep. So then the next thing was, was I'd put a column down the middle and say, well, how would God feel about that? How do you reckon God would feel? It? Would God... Would, what would God's feelings be about all of my family and all of my friends deciding to leave me because I'm in a state of truth? What do you think God would feel about that, just as an idea? He's totally cool about that, isn't he? Why would he be totally cool about that? Because I'm living in truth. So therefore, where's the error from, their perspective, from his perspective? 
the error is with the people who want to not love me anymore because I'm in truth. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, I'm not. I could easily then go intellectually down there, couldn't I? And I could easily then go down the track of saying, "All right, I can accept God's truth." But the truth is inside of my soul. I couldn't accept God's truth. I couldn't accept that it was not of any matter if my family totally ostracised me. Right. My father didn't speak to me for nearly, yeah, for nearly seven years. Oh. Right? Didn't speak to me at all. They, they, um, he, would, he would look at me and not speak to me. I had my, my friends, all of my friends, I would walk down the street and they would look at me and walk across the road and walk somewhere else. Couldn't Every single friend that I ever had before I was 33 years of age, never spoke to me again. There must have been some crazy emotions you were showing. All I did was leave a religion that said you couldn't leave it. Oh, right? That's all I did. Jehovah's Witnesses. So I had to list my fear. What was my fear? I would lose everything. That was my fear. What was God's feeling about that? She be fine. God's feeling was, it's going to be all right. Yeah. I've still, I'll look after you, mate. Yeah, I've still got you, right? <laughs> now, the third step then was to actually feel the feeling that I was feeling that was in error. Okay? That's the hard part, isn't it? But at least if I've listed every fear and I've listed how God would feel about that, at least I know where I'm in error. And so what that did for me was it showed me one thing. I am in error with my emotion. In other words, my fear was not real. It was an error from God's perspective. But now that you've expelled that fear, would you then... You're you no longer in error on that school? Once I, well, I had to work through the emotion of being totally abandoned by all my friends and my family. That took me nearly two years of crime. Mm -hmm. right? Now, I'm not that saying it's going to take you that long. That's just how long it took me. Mm -hmm. right? Now, after that, I then started feeling feelings that, hang on a sec, I am worthy to have friends. And I'm worthy to have people who love me. Mm -hmm. Right? But it took two years to feel that. And now, ironically, it doesn't matter to me whether my family don't speak to me or not. <coughs> At all. I still feel I can feel love to them. My sister hasn't spoken to me now for 12 years. Oh, she's right? So she, ha she hasn't spoken to me for 12 years. And, and I, I, can, I can love her. I don't feel mm. sad about I don't even feel sad about that anymore. But I did cry for a long time about it, mm. to release that emotion. <clears throat> so is that all religion based? Um, for my sister it is, yeah. But there's also some emotional issues too, obviously. The emotional issue is that, you know, she, she has a real aversion to truth in her own life as well. And she knows now that I'm staying, like, that I'm speaking the truth about emotions that it's a very, very difficult thing for her to face, the truth about emotions in her own life. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, it's very much to do with religious judgment. Yeah. So, can you um, explain uh, your statement, I am error with my emotion, again? Alright. <coughs> if I have a fear, or I have any emotion for that matter, that God doesn't have, then that emotion is an error that's within me. Does that make sense? Yeah. That emotion is an error, an emotional thing <coughs> inside of me that I need to release because it's in error. If I want to be at one with God, this is. So I'm assuming we want to be at one with God. Right? Of course, if I just want to be at one with myself, I can hold on to all the errors I want. But if I want to be at one with God, then I know that I needed to release that. So firstly, I needed to identify what the errors are. This is how I thought intellectually at the beginning. It's not how I do it now. I'm just saying this is how I started to deal with my emotions. 
right? And I'm and I'm not suggesting that you do it this way. It's just a, these are just ideas about how. Didn't uh, you go like totally crazy by the overwhelm of the sheer amount of errors that you identified after a while? Yeah, because right. it what happens to me. Well, when I make uh, a list like that. It seems so overwhelming. All those errors that I'm still living in, yeah. despite the fact that I do release them continuously, yeah. and there is still so many. And that and brought up lots of emotions yes. for me too, yes. like so emotions of like. What am I useless or something? Like, yeah. why can't I get it? You know, what all of those kind of emotions started coming up and as how well. Can how can I have? I had 33 pages mm -hmm. of this. Yes, 33 pages. That's right. So, how did you handle not go nuts? Hey, how did you handle not Well, for the next two days, I did go nuts. And I let myself go nuts, right? And I let myself cry and, and try and punish myself for having 33 pages of fears that were in disharmony with God. Can you release these by crying? Well, it depends what they are. Um, in, in some cases, the fears were terror. Like, um, yeah. I have a lot of abuse type emotions from the first century experience, like torture abuse type emotions mm -hmm. from the first century experience. When I started releasing those, I, was, I went through the like feelings of torture and so forth. How do you release them? By feeling, by experiencing right. them as right. you experience them in the beginning. And it's just a matter of trusting all the emotions that come up in that experience. Would you scream? Oh yeah, like for the, the first set of emotions that I dealt with after I dealt with this was the feelings of terror that I had. And the, the, way, the only way that my body seemed to be able to deal with that was I would go into this state of being totally locked up my, my whole body would cramp, my legs would go back up, my arms would go back up, my whole face would distort, and I'd just sit there, or when I say sit, I used to just lie on the floor in this tremendous pain for a couple of hours. And, just, yeah. and quite a number of times I didn't breathe, and I passed out mm -hmm. like, with it as well. But you still had the intention to heal and connect at that time? Yeah. Yeah, this is soon after I began my emotional work, those, those emotions started. But that lasted three months. Did you scream a lot? Yeah, yeah, of course. And that emotion lasted three months doing it, like every morning and every night that would happen to me. Mm. Right? No and control. the first lot was, yeah, the first lot was a couple of hours and it slowly, and then by the end of three months it was five minutes. And by then I was totally feeling inside of myself that I could cope with that emotion quite easily. Right? But that, that was all the terror coming out. There's all this terror that has guided my life for so long. All just came out in three months. Mm. Right. So my body's going a bit crazy like that at the moment. Yeah. So I just mm -hmm. let myself feel it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just let yourself feel it. So I'd be on the floor, and quite often uh, this was, I was by myself, right? Because nobody would speak to me, <laughs> and I had no friends. Yeah. Right. So so I was living by myself, and and so <laughs> there's no one to come and rescue you. Or anything like that. So so I had to go and just do that each day. And I just did that each day. On a mattress? Well, I didn't try to do it. My body no. just went into that yeah. state when I allowed myself to breathe. And one of the things that you must do, by the way, and I must write that down. Diaphragmatically. Mm How do you spell breathe? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Dia, here we go. From Into your tummy. Attic. Is that right? Hello. Just put tummy. Into tummy. I would have just put grease in the diaphragm. I would have said into tummy. Cheer breeze. Your first century life. Have you ever cleared those to get to 20 seconds? Yeah, but I explained yesterday, remember, that all of the memories from a first century existence or any existence get passed through the emotional filters of your parents at the moment you re reincarnate. Right? So, so all of those memories got passed through my mother's and father's emotional fears and, and all of those kind of things. And I've had lots of, obviously, experiences in 2,000 years. And all of those experiences got passed through my parents' emotions, which grossly distorts all of those experiences. Did you have negative experiences in, in the spirit world? <coughs> no. No, certainly not. But all of those things that happened in the spirit world got passed through... The memories got passed mm -hmm. through the emotional distortions of my parents' filters. You follow me? Because those emotions get impressed upon the soul of the child at the time of incarnation. Right? 
So, so what happened was, for example, in the spirit world, there were some feelings that I had about always being the first person to enter into a new sphere, into a new dimension. So there was, there's been times in my life, all the way through my progression, where I've been the first person to get to a certain <coughs> location and no one else was there. Right? Now, that was a beautiful experience for me at the time. Right? Every new sphere or dimensional existence that was created because of my new soul condition right, was a beautiful experience for me to experience. But passed through my mother's filters of abandonment and loneliness, what did it become? You're on your own baby. I'm on my own all the time. I'm on my own all the time. I keep having to you know, be out there all the time and nobody agreeing with me all the time. Mm, nobody wanting to me. understand, nobody understands me. The trail that, that's what it became. Yeah. Is that, you follow that? Like, mm -hmm. that's how all of these experiences through these filters become a, some, a totally different experience. Become the sum total of... Sorry? It becomes the sum total of your reality. Yeah, so while all of these things are emotions within me, which all need to be released, obviously they're not what I felt at the time. Right? No, no. They are quite different than what I felt at the time. But the result is the same as what you feel. The result is that you have these feelings too within you, don't you? Well, of being abandoned and being alone and nobody understanding you. Now, how many of you feel that? Mm -hmm. right? They're all common emotions, aren't they? Right? And so that is the same thing that's happened with me, but just a different way. That's all. That's a different way that it entered me. So, so AJ, the only reason that you've come back and experiencing all those filters is so that you can understand what we're feeling. Isn't yeah, it? I didn't understand in the first century what you were feeling. Really? Yeah. Even though you were human. Yeah, but what happened in the first century was that I, I had, um, I had an existence that began with the clearing out. In, in the spirit world, there's a process that, in fact, all of you at some point will probably go through or you will observe. And, oh, hang a sec, no, probably most of you are not ever going to exert, uh, go through it personally because you'll probably deal with all your emotions here. But, but many of you may observe this occurring after you've passed. And that is, there is whole areas of the spirit world which are devoted to the healing of emotion, emotional baggage within the soul of an individual that's caused by everything that's outside of their control. <clears throat> right? um, in the book uh, of Robert James Lee's called Through the Mists, I think it is, there's a description of what's called the magnetic corral. And there's a chapter on that if you want to read it. And it's a description of what actually happens to the souls of people who have been damaged quite badly by the environment around them without any of their own emotions being involved. And what happens is groups of people get together and actually heal that person of all the emotional damage that they were not responsible for. Yeah. And so be careful, some of the, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about mostly the chi a lot of the childhood stuff, right? right? It's not stuff that happens as adults, because remember a lot of that is due to the laws of attraction, right? So we're talking about a lot of the childhood stuff being released. So what actually happens to them is that, is that a lot of that childhood stuff that caused all the damage gets released. And only the things that you made decisions about that caused damage remains within you that you need to deal with. Right? Now, that process happened to me as soon as I was born in the first century. A group of spirits got together and actually did that for me in the first century. Why did they do that? Because they, dis they, they had been asked by God to do those things for me. They had feelings from God to do those things. Mm. They were like celestial. No, they were six fear spirits. <coughs> there were no celestial spirits in existence at that stage. Is that, was that called the virgin birth? Yeah, what they call the virgin birth. Obviously, obviously, but yeah, obviously there was no virgin birth. Of course, yes, right? But, but um, once I was born... These spirits got together and cleared away the emotional damage from my parents right at that point. Are you the only one that's ever happened to? Yeah. Yep. How did they do that, though, if they weren't connected to God? Because I thought you said six sphere spirits aren't connected to God. Well, I'm saying they're not at one with God. Oh. But they can have a desire to talk to God and so forth, just like any other person. So do they get messages from God? Certainly they did. Yeah. And certainly they still do. I see. Yeah. Yeah. 
but so they're not at one with God. There's a difference different. between being connected and... Well, they're, not, they're connected in the sense that they can hear a message from God to do mm. something. Mm. Just like we can. Just like you can, whether you're connected to God or not. Mm. Right? You can hear a message from God and do something about it. And often things happen in your life right now where this actually doesn't occur. Right? Mm. Where you trust your intuition and follow that. Mm. Or, still, sorry, sorry. I was yeah. going to continue with yeah. the story if that's all right. Yeah. Yeah. So there were no yeah. celestial spirits at that time. There was no seventh sphere at that mm -hmm. time. Right? There was no seven, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh. None of those spheres existed at that time. None of those dimensional spaces. And what happened was, the, once those emotions were cleared, then I was <coughs> left to develop just with what actually happened from that point on. And in that process, I didn't understand... I could feel everyone else's emotions, right? I could feel my own mother's emotions, I could feel my father's emotions, I could feel my friend's emotions, and so forth, from a very, very young age. But I could never understand from the point of view of having experienced them myself. You follow that? Like, because it wasn't a part of my experience. So of all the spirits in the spirit world, I have been the spirit who's been the least educated <laughs> right, about what it's actually like to feel, from a condition of error, feel and process emotion. So this makes you a better teacher now than mm -hmm. um, yeah, in the first century. Yeah, because in the first century, I could feel all of their emotion and I could reflect back at them what was going on. But I had never experienced what it was like. So there was always this feeling that people had around me that I didn't understand really, that I didn't really get them. Yeah, right? so you can't really meet them right where they are then. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And that's, uh, my soulmate could. My soulmate didn't have the same experience as myself, and she could. And so that even throughout our spirit life, that was a major thing for me, for me trust because I trusted her, a lot of her, her direction and, and her feelings about people, because I knew that I hadn't had the same experience she had. Right? So I was actually severely limited by that particular event, in a way. So while I understood everyone's emotions, I did not personally experience them ever. And so therefore, how can I really understand? But you had a lot, lot more love than everybody though, didn't you? In yeah, but that was just a reflection of my father's love, which, yeah. which is obviously a, a, a huge thing, which you know when you're feeling that <coughs> yourself, like you know how powerful that love is. And obviously I displayed love in every circumstance, because obviously I was at one with God. However, the feelings that a lot of people had when I did that were, were feelings of anger or resentment. Mm. Right? This is recorded in the Bible, a lot of this, right? Mm -hmm. How many times do people get angry and resentful with me? I would say a truth. Oh, you're a hypocrite. Mm. Right? What's a hypocrite by definition? A person that says one thing and does another, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, the majority of the Pharisees that I spent time with were that. Yeah. So I just said that truth. How did they take it? <laughs> Not very well. Not very well. So, hey, just one question. Like, so being human with our emotions and baggage, which like so many of us have done workshops and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to heal, and it's you know been such a hard journey for me anyway, personally. Yep. Yep. Is this one of the most difficult um, experiences in the universe, like to be human and with this... Emotional the most difficult experience, I believe, in, in the universe is to actually live in a state of error yeah. and come into truth. Mm. That is so difficult because I believe my error to be truth. Mm. And that, that is a, and see, in the first century, I wasn't faced with that issue. Like, as I, if you can imagine, you have no error within you, just imagine that for a moment. <laughs> so, yeah. there's, so there's no emotion of anger, there's no emotion of sadness, there's no emotion. You've only got emotions that are happy, blissful type of emotions. You're not at one with God yet, right? You're not at one with God yet, but you feel these emotions constantly where you're just happy most. All the time you're happy, everything in life's going pretty smooth, law of attraction's working great because you've got none of those causal emotions within you. Imagine that for a moment. And then someone comes along, like AJ, and says, oh, you can decide to be at one with God, and this is how you do it. Are you going to find it easy or hard? Uh, I reckon you're going to find it easy. Because you've got no emotional baggage. You're not coming from a position of error. 
you're coming from a position of truth. The only thing you need to learn is humility. You only need to learn to seek love and seek truth from God. That's all you need to learn. Those three basic things, you're already doing the third, which is feeling all of your emotions. This, yeah? uh, this only, what you said, this only is really, to me, seems to be the crux of it. Hmm? Um, you mentioned before that you had this massive or absolute meltdown, uh, almost like a social and familiar annihilation yep. happened to you. Um, to me, all the people that I know who have transformed, or who, who have become real as what you're saying, what we're talking about here, seem to go, have gone through this. Yes. They seem to have no longer felt that there is a choice for me between truth and error, but that I cannot live differently than in truth, yes. and that everything else has to place itself around it. If, if it doesn't, it doesn't. If it does, it's good. That's it. However, um, what I see is that most, most uh, well, of my friends or people say, for example, I know a uh, Jehovah's Witness uh, friend of mine. Yep. He was prepared to do this. And his family and friends declared him almost like a dead person. That's right. And um, he then went back to his sister, and his sister is still a witness, and um, they talked. And she told him, yes, okay, I understand everything you say, mm -hmm. I feel it, but I can't do it because think about it, I would lose everything. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and, and this is the thing, is that how prepared are you to actually feel that everything in your life that you think is real is actually just an illusion. And lose everything. And how prepared are you to actually live that? If that feeling of uh, bliss and everything is an illusion and you really do have baggage but you don't feel it, you don't want to know about it, yeah. I mean, so you're worried that the feeling of bliss might be an illusion? Yes, that's right. Okay. So that's one of your fears? No. It's not. <laughs> the only way you will know whether a feeling of bliss is illusion is for you to feel the feeling of bliss and then you'll know whether it was an illusion or not. Isn't it the only way for you to know whether anything is an illusion or not? So, for example, how do you know if you love? Isn't it? Because you can feel it inside of you, and then you know. You can't describe it, you don't think it. It's a feeling inside of you, right? There's different degrees of love, too. True, but now you're intellectualising. Right? Because why do we want to do that? Why do we want to do it? Because we want something to compare with. Our mind screams at us for something to compare. Something to balance things out. Something to know that I'm on the right path, that I'm actually doing the most logical thing. And this is what I'm saying is the soul, the real you, is the only thing that is able to show you what's logical. Right? It's the only thing that can do that. That was the exact question that came up after seeing you last week, was how do I know, how do I know, truly know, which is absolute God and which is just, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever, plane. How will I know which is really, truly God? Oh, can I just go back to this at yeah. some stage in the future? Because <laughs> we want to look at some practical things you can do. Um, at the start, you won't. Okay. Okay. Here's God. <coughs> Here's your soul. The connection there was? Holy Spirit. Right? Which is the connection of truth, isn't it? Yes. So it's all to do with truth. Yeah. You can't maintain a connection with God unless you're in emotional <laughs> truth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then the divine love flows through that connection to you. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. Right. <coughs> divine love brings a feeling. Every time it flows through you, it brings a feeling of Yes. Okay. Now, what you're really saying is, how do I know that that's God I'm talking to? Yeah. How do I know it's not just some spirit? Yes. 
because higher spirits understand. can help you feel peace and harmony and feel good and blissful and. Mm. But can you see that your question is born out of a mistrust? Mm. Absolutely. What's the mistrust? Mm. <coughs> of my feeling of knowing God. Well, it's actually the mistrust is of God. Because what you're saying is you're, you're mistrusting that when you long to God for love, ah. that you're not going to get it from God, you're going to get it from someone else. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Right? So in, our, in reality, the emotion that you need to feel is, I don't actually trust that God's set up things in such a way yeah. that He wants to well, answer me. Answer me. Yeah. Thank you. What's your opinion on avatars and them being born enlightened and stuff? Yeah. best way probably is to, again, draw a bit of a diagram. Mm. Here's the spe spheres of the spirit. Right? <coughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven, and then the seventh, the transition to seventh, the eighth, is at one with God. Every single person at one with God does not define themselves as anything different to how you define yourself. <clears throat> Do you know what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. In other words, every angel in that location <coughs> was in fact a person who was on earth at some point. Every person in that location believes themselves to be exactly the same as you. They will never call themselves an avatar. They will never call themselves your teacher even. Right? They will never call themselves your master. Quite often I'm called the master and I don't like it because it's just like, what's it saying? Yeah. It's, holding you up to it's holding me up above yeah. and it's not true. Yeah. I'm not above anyone. You follow me? So every single person there will never feel themselves to be greater than you are. Now, in the sixth sphere, there are many spirits in the sixth sphere who believe themselves to be God. <clears throat> uh, the majority of them, in fact, feel that they are God. They feel at that point what at one moment with God means is that because we're all at one with God, is what they tell themselves, they all become God. So they're all just pieces of God. And so when they communicate with you, they start saying to you that it's God talking to you. And it happens in many other spheres lower than the six too. For instance, the conversations with God, with Neil Donald Walsh, for example. It was conversations with a spirit who thought himself as God. Right? And it's a second sphere spirit. Anyway, the avatars, what happens is many spirits in this condition here look at the earth and they're very, very interested in helping the earth. Very interested in helping people on earth be in a higher state of love. So what they do is they choose some parents who they feel, so here's the parents, right, who they feel are quite connected with God, who are going to have a child that's going to be quite mediumistic. Right? Mediumistic. Any person who's quite free of emotions is going to be quite mediumistic. Right? And when I say quite free of emotions, I don't mean they have no emotions. What I mean is, there are some emotions, and the emotions in particular are the ones connected with the spirit, that they don't have. In other words, they're comfortable talking to people they can't see. Right? Not many of us are comfortable doing that, are we? Right? So there are people who are comfortable doing that, who recognise the truth of doing that, and many of them come from, right? some of them come from parents who have also had that same ability. In other words, the emotional injury that causes you to disconnect from spirits, they don't have. Huh? So what these spirits here do is they select this child and then they actually become connected with the child while it's in the womb generally. Huh? And then they heavily influence that child with their own teachings and beliefs and systems. Now, every Dalai Lama has had this happen to them. Mm. Right? in subsequent generations. Mm. Right? And every Dalai Lama, generally, if you hear them speak, you'll find that they'll get to a point where they feel the disconnection from that spirit. Because what, that's usually what happens, is they get to a stage in their own development where they no longer need that assistance. And the spirit is disconnected. So what happens is that this 
Spirit here then guides this person as they're growing. And this person then is often called an avatar. Right? A person who already knows the truth even from the moment they were born. In reality, the Spirit is the one who knows the truth. And they are just heavily influenced by that Spirit. Mm -hmm. And the, spirits, the Spirit in the sixth sphere, who does it, no Spirit in the seventh sphere or above would do it. But the Spirit in the sixth sphere who chooses to do it, decides to do it because he feels that it's the most loving thing he can do to help people on the earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why they're focused in that manner. Is that like the best they can do for us? That's the best a person in the sixth sphere can actually do for somebody on the earth, yes. So from their own perspective, they are feeling like, this is the best thing I can do to demonstrate my love for people on earth who I really want to be in a state of love. It's still got to be a higher truth on earth, though, doesn't it? It's still got to be helpful. <clears throat> or is it unhelpful? Well, it, it certainly is helpful. If this spirit's love is reflecting through this person, mm -hmm. then obviously every person around that person is going to feel a higher degree of love at different times. Mm -hmm. The problem becomes is what's happening to the person. Mm -hmm. The person themselves often passes without clearing any of their negative emotional baggage. Mm -hmm. Which means that they often pass into the first sphere of the spirit world with lots of emotional baggage, but particularly in the, in the Eastern philosophies with usually a lot of sexual baggage, because oftentimes they feel that they have sexual relationships because of this love coming from them, they're attracting lots of women in particular, or that, that they have sexual relationships with, and they, they cause a lot of self-damage in that process. And then by the time they pass, they're actually passing into the first sphere. So the person themselves is in a first sphere condition when they pass and then needs a lot of help to get... So the spirit's taking them over in a good way, yep. what they think is a good way, yep. but because they're taken over, they don't deal with their own shit. Yep. And also, when you think about it, no spirit above there will do that. And the reason why is because the free will of that soul is paramount to a person that's at one with God. The free will of that soul is not paramount to the person who's in the sixth sphere. The sixth sphere thinks in a more collective manner. In other words, they think that what's good for the whole is good for the one. You said that Hitler and um, uh, somebody else were in the first sphere. Yeah, well they were in the hells of the first sphere. There were like yeah, thousands of planes in the first sphere. Yeah, and the darkest planes are the, the deepest planes are where Hitler were and ones, ones like that in history has been. So, what would be some examples like um, David Hawkins, all this stuff on? Almost every single form of spiritual development that has ever occurred on Earth has been influenced by a spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some very clear things that you can see about that, like the Book of Mormon, for example. There's there's an obvious spirit influence there. I don't know if any of you have been associated with the Mormon religion, but Joseph Smith received channeling, channeled information from spirits. Right? And so that, that whole religious form was created, if you like, by spirits, not by persons on earth. Was that the six spirits? Uh, they were in the six spirits, yeah, the spirits, uh, uh, yep, and channeled information. But the information was very biblically based and then modified and so forth. So there were... So the Ramtha in that from the sixth was in the sixth sphere up until very, very recently. Yeah, I've been really connected with him. Yeah. yeah. What happened uh, about two and a half years ago, actually, I, I actually spoke to Ramtha about the Divine Love Path. Before then, he was on the Natural Love Path, and he instantly changed on the Divine Love Path as soon as we spoke. It's very so unusual. He was coming from the sixth sphere. He was in the sixth sphere? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how long did it take him to progress? He, he, within a few weeks, was in a, in a one in a condition with God. He, Rantha had a, a very interesting soul feelings from his soul. And his, the feelings from his soul were quite deep emotions about caring and loving people on earth. He had a really strong desire to help people on earth. And his strong love was something that was really powerful for him. And so what happened as soon as he heard about the divine path, he instantly saw that the divine path was a way for him to more powerfully assist people on earth. When you say divine path, what do you mean? Um, we, that was in the introduction DVDs. Yeah. 
Divine path, two paths. Um, yes, there are two paths you can go by. <laughs> and, <laughs> quote for you. <laughs> and the divine path is a path that actually is what I'm describing, which is this emotional connection with God and longing for God's love to enter you. The natural love path is developing your love to its fullest capacity to reflect to others. Can you like see the difference? My suggestion is to watch the original DVD if you can. The the um, Ramp was on the natural love path, right? And communicating with Jay Z Knight here on Earth, and influencing her and many of the followers to follow the techniques and metaphysical techniques that he had developed in order to help a person on that natural love path. What happened when we discussed it? He was with his soulmate as well. He, He'd been in the spirit world for 35,000 years or so. And, and so he'd been in that state for most of that time. And when we talked about it with him, he instantly saw the need to actually follow the divine love path if he wanted to have a more powerful help. Did he have to go back a bit? He had to, yeah. But he did all of that. Time is not a constraint. And he did all that within a few days. So within a few days, he was actually on the divine love path and actually in the state of it one month with God. There was very little he needed to work through emotionally. And where is he now? He, he's, I think he's in the ninth sphere actually now, but he's growing very rapidly. Does that mean some of his techniques that he's still teaching is, you know, was limited? <coughs> yeah, I don't know if you know what's happened to Jay Z uh, recently. Um, I've just got some more takes about the consciousness and energy. Techniques. Yeah, what, what's happened to Jay Z Knight as a result of this is that she now is in a state of a fair bit of confusion. Mm. Because what, what's going on is that the spirit who was connecting with her is now no longer connecting with her because he can't, because she doesn't believe what he's saying to her anymore. And so he, she had been trying to connect with some other spirits who wanted to take over from Rantha, but she could feel, she is quite sensitive to energy. So she was quite sensitive to the fact that they're different. And so now she's in a bit of a state of confusion. And this is why recently in her world tours, she's having, she doesn't understand why. But she's having quite a bit of confusion as so a result. she's not channeling him anymore? No, but she could. Yeah. She could. As soon as she got onto the divine love path, she would be able to channel him again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. So, in the beginning, there was Adam and Eve. Yep. Ammon and Amman, they're called. Yep. And then, so how do we, how do we kind of answer the, the different races, the Asians and Africans and stuff? With... Yep. Mm -hmm. Did I answer this question good enough for you? Yeah, it was brilliant. No, thank you so much. Well, uh, I'd have to talk about genetics. Do you want to talk about genetics, really? Yeah. I'd prefer to talk about emotions, but... Um, Let's talk about some strategies for getting, getting onto core emotions. Yeah, but, but I'd like to just briefly ask, a, ask the question. Um, who have ever bred dogs or horses or anything like that? Yeah. You know that you put certain characteristics together with other characteristics and you get a totally different breed, don't you? And then it's a matter of, and very much so with horses, this is the case, you see it a lot, where you'll choose certain characteristics from one, certain characteristics from another, and you'll breed those in and you'll get those characteristics dominant. What actually happened was because of the emotional condition of certain families way back at early times in our history, what happened is certain families chose to stick together and only, only have sex with each other. And, and it was obviously wrong to have sex with any other of the families. What that does is it makes certain things dominant, certain uh, genetic characteristics dominant in that family strain. And those characteristics then become so dominant that it becomes all of the characteristics of that race, if you like. And that happened uh, way before the time of um, uh, Lemuria and Atlantis, right, where all of these <coughs> races started to become dominant because of the families becoming separate from each other. In, this is why you get things like genetic throwbacks, um, where you know, sometimes two white people can have a, a, a dark child, or a dark ch person, two dark people can have a white child. And those kind of things happen because there are, at times, genetic throwbacks that occur. Right? But all the, all the genetics God built within us are all based on soul conditions. So, so in other words, it's only, 
It's only, um, this is going to be challenging. Mm. <laughs> it's our soul condition that creates genetic imperfection. You follow me? Mm. It's the emotion in your soul that creates a genetic imperfection in your physical genetic structure. And that physical imperfection, because it's in your genetic structure, will get passed down now to subsequent generations. And of course, your soul condition also gets passed down to subsequent generations because of that's how the emotions enter each child, right? And so it looks like to be a physical problem when in reality it's an emotional, emotional issue. Ah, so when my father was growing up, there were a lot of short Italians and yeah. it was after wartime. Yeah. And, and then they're out working at the age of 13, like working 12, 10 hour days yeah. at 13. So I can see, I actually used to think about this as a child. It's all to do with emotions. They are emotionally, yes, yeah, suppressed, yeah. burdened, yeah. heartache, grief, not having food. Yeah. And, and, and the growth was stunted. Well, my growth um, has been stunted through emotions. Yeah, uh, I'm aware of that. Mm. I can feel my body, what, what, where it should be mm -hmm. and where it is now. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. dwarfism, um, dwarfism is the same thing? Yes, yeah, very much the same thing. All, and all genetic, even issues like um, Down syndrome and mm. all those kind of issues are all, all to do with genetic structures being modified by certain emotional conditions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what about inbreeding in that? <clears throat> well, uh, um, another challenging thing for you, right back at Am I Not a Man stage, obviously when there were adults, when they were so their children, they had children who became adults. Mm. Obviously, when they're adults, they could one of the, one of them was a soulmate of another. Obviously, mm. right? And because there's no genetic or very little genetic imperfection, the only genetic imperfection primarily that res existed at that stage was due to self reliance. And it was quite easy for them to get together and have children without there being any damage to, at all to the physical form. <laughs> The physical form's damage only occurs because of the emotional damage that's occurred subsequently. And what about, what about the uh, evolutionary theory, you know, the, the bones that they find of the early people? Man, man started at a certain location, which was at a six-sphere, you could say it's a six-sphere condition. That's where Ammon and Aman began. What happened is due to their, their decisions, their desires, they walked away from God, and man very, quite rapidly actually degraded in condition. And at one point they got to the stage where they were a little better than in terms of their own actions and their own moral, moral <coughs> condition to an animal. And, and their physical form changed as a result of that to that same condition. Is that Neanderthal? Yeah, so what they call Neanderthal <coughs> man and all those different types of... A lot of them were just people in the lowest form of their evolution. So you could say what happened was the devolution of man. Right? Then, because all of these people had died and passed into the spirit world and slowly progressed up the spirit world in love, one, two, three, four, up the spheres, and they started to be able to influence the people on earth still, then man started evolving. And, start, and we are still evolving because of the influence that we're getting from spirits. But there is no Who were on the earth before. There is no historical record of the devolution. No, what it happened... begins at the evolution. What happened with a lot of the devolution of man was that there were some very cataclysmic events on earth, like the sinking of Atlantis and those kind of events that occurred that caused all records of this devolution process to actually be lost to man. But what will happen in the future is there will be changes to the earth that will expose some of these records mm -hmm. and man will be able to see that this is what actually did occur. Where did the people from Atlantis come from? Um, well, they all came from Anamar Anamar. <coughs> they are like humans, they yeah. come from out there. Yeah, they are. Yeah. So, so where do they fit into the diagram? Is that where you dropped six spheres? Uh, yeah. And yet that, that six sphere, that's not in the... Are you saying that's not in a, a spiritual world sense, that's on earth? That's right, yeah. yeah. <coughs> Don't think that I'm talking about a sixth fear. Remember this is all conditions of love. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking they were in a condition of love, of natural love, that they were perfect. They were created perfect in natural love. 
And they had the opportunity, God <coughs> gave them the opportunity to receive divine love, which they rejected. Right? You can read all of this in the Paget messages, if you want to. AJ, what, what determines where we end up in the sense that, you know, from a, um, a reincarnational point of view, if you end up being lucky enough to live in Australia, then it's obviously, you know, you've done well in the past and, and somehow you've earned, earned the right to incarnate into somewhere nice like where we are here. No. But if that doesn't apply, I mean, how did we get... I mean, I was over in India recently and it, it's, it's not that great over there. Mm -hmm. And we live in paradise here. How, how did we get so lucky? Um, there's a lot of factors at work about the law of attraction. Um, when you get to the state where in the 20 seconds for your state, you can actually see the law of attraction at work in every single case of incarnation. Because you actually see the personality of the soul incarnating as well. And what's happened is that groups of souls, if you like, which have a, a natural affinity in the spirit world before they incarnate, they're not conscious of that affinity, but they are similar in personality, and that causes an attraction. You follow me? So, no. So they've already been... So God has already created this soul, but he, it hasn't decided to incarnate. That's right, and it's not conscious of itself at this point. Are they like eggs that haven't hatched? They're like eggs that haven't hatched, but they have personality. Okay, and do they gather together? And they gather together in groups. What do they do? As far as I'm aware, there's yeah. continual creation. So they gather together, and what do they just hang out like grapes? Well, they're not conscious of it. Define personality. That that fascinates me. The the knowing that God created these souls with personality, what does it mean? Have you watched the, the first CD, the DVD? Yes. Because I've defined it in there. Oh, okay. but, but just to revise it, it's the, the condition is personality is to do with what God has given you as a part of your natural state. Could that be mediumistic? Um, is it a quality or a personality? Yeah, well... Um, Your character. Every, per, every personality, quality or character can be modified by you through your experience. Okay. So in other words, I might be born without uh, any artistic ability whatsoever. Mm. But there's other people that are just born automatically with an artistic ability. Mm. Why is that? Well, it's because they have a dominant thing in their mm. soul mm. which causes them to feel more artistic within themselves. Mm. And that is part of their personality. Does that make sense? And they can then develop that or suppress that. That's the call. You all have totally unique abilities and totally unique things going, personality traits inside of you that I don't have and I will never have. I can develop them. I can notice them in you and say, I like that. I want to give that a go. But I will never have it to your ability. And there are some things inside of you that you'll never have to mind as well, it's because we're all unique. God created us in this way. Because of this uniqueness, you, and I would call that personality, right? personality which is really millions and millions of traits that are built inside of you that are different to the next person that's sitting next to you. Right? And you have the ability to suppress them or develop them. Any one of them. Or the majority of them. It just depends on how, how you feel. It takes as long as it takes. Now, that's personality. Individuality is totally different. What individuality is, is the ability to know yourself, to be conscious or self conscious, self aware. Does that make sense? <laughs> At the moment of your birth, if you could call it that, as a soul, you were not conscious or aware of your own personality. You had no conscious awareness of who you are. And it's the process of incarnation, which is the separation of the soul into its two halves, that creates the awareness. So incarnation is an important process in you becoming self-aware. And that's why God created that process. And the beauty of the earth environment is it is a pristine environment, even though you may not think so. It's a pristine environment for helping you become self-aware. Now, how long do you spend um, floating around? Well, there's souls that have spent billions of years there. 
uh, never never came into a body. Not yet. They will. But obviously they're not aware they've spent billions of years of our time there. And what's time anyway? anyway? And what's time anyway? They haven't got a choice though. Sorry? They haven't got a choice. They will eventually incarnate. Okay. But they'll they they be chosen by parents. They will all be chosen by parents. So exactly. how do we end up being here on the Sunshine Coast? Well, your parents <laughs> chose your personal personality and your soul, obviously. And then the law of attraction is at work after that point. Well, at, at that point, the law of attraction is at work. So it's a soul choosing, isn't it? The, whatever the Not the intellect. Yeah. So the, the emotions in the soul. So the mother choosing. has certain personality traits. And the father the has soul. certain personality traits. They both have certain emotional set and conditions within themselves. And, that. and that attracts a certain soul with certain personality traits in the spirit, in the soul world that is yet to incarnate. So is that why Indians end up having Indians? Um, <laughs> from God's perspective, there's no such thing as an Indian soul or an Australian soul or an American, American soul or any of those kind of things. But there are certain personality traits that obviously are affected by those attractions. Genetics. AJ, why did you um, incarnate it in Australia? And because it was the place that was going to be the fastest possible place to develop people spiritually on the divine love path. How come? Because of the nature of our, of our country. Um, the nature of our country is that we have very little um, superiority issues. Mm -hmm. you know, most of us feel equal with everyone else generally. Uh, we also have a very loose viewpoint of religion. Right? So it's very, we're very free in those two, uh, two aspects. And we also have the ability in Australia to, allow, to be, uh, be allowed to feel our own emotions generally a lot more than many other Western nations. Even men, because men, Australian men don't feel. <laughs> 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 Who have you been attracted to? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, now you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason why you've been attracting. I've been a 65 year old man, two and a half years ago. He's really into feeling emotions. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. Good hope for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's to do with the law of attraction that yeah. you feel that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, in answer to your question, though, completely, is that um, we chose a number of different locations around the. There's 14 people who initially chose to reincarnate. Mm -hmm. And we chose a number of different places around the earth because those places were going to be the first places that we felt, or the places that were going to be the uh, places that would be more important in the beginning to actually develop get you know, going. And, and get going in terms of a spiritual sense. So um, six of the 14 incarnated into Australia. Six. And then there's uh, two in Canada. There's two who incarnated into South America but are now living in Barbados. And there's two in South Africa. Um, and there's two who are Vietnamese. And they'll be world teachers? Um, well, they'll be what they choose, whatever that is, because their free will is still operational. Many of them are having a lot of difficulty with dealing with their emotions, <coughs> because not only do they have the average emotions that you have to deal with, but they also have some major identity issues to deal with as well. And that's causing them a lot of internal stress, which, which is difficult for them to cope with. So at the moment, about seven or eight of the 14 are dealing with their emotions consistently and they understand what's going on. And the other six of the 14, one of them has died already, and uh, was murdered, and then five of the other five are just finding a struggle to deal with their different emotions, although a number of them are aware of who they are. Mm. So, in the end of whether they'll be world teachers or not, many of you will be world teachers before they will be, probably. AJ, hey getting back to the soul and the attraction of children, um, you were saying at one of the meetings here where the, uh, the lady said she didn't know, didn't have any feelings of love, but God, oh, well, her, the law of attraction was she attracted young children, her babies were very loving. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that meeting? Yeah, but... So is that a... That same lady... <laughs> is that a... I, re I know the lady. Yeah. And the same lady believes she doesn't have any feelings of love, and that in her soul is quite different. It's her injuries. Yeah, so uh, what she was... And this is the thing you, many of you will need to remember in statements that are made by other people to you, is that many times they're saying it as if they believe it to be the truth. Mm, mm. But in reality, 
It is an yeah. actual emotional error where they're judging themselves. Yeah, okay. Right? And if you accept that judgment rather than understanding the, and the feelings that are coming from them, mm -hmm. then you'll mm -hmm. often feel there's a disharmony. Mm -hmm. Remember that everything from a celestial point of view is governed by the emotional attractions. And all of those attractions are based on truth and love. And so from a celestial point of view, you can see the attractions very easily and why different people have attracted different things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not so easy here on Earth looking at it. Individuality, the ability to, there was a to be self-aware. Self <coughs> yeah. so, so getting back to the individuality discussion, there's a difference between personality and individuality. Individuality is you have become self-aware. You now know you are an individual. You now know you can think, feel, taste, do whatever you wish to do, choose to do. And you have the right to do that. You've been giving the free will to do that. You're now even aware that you have free will, perhaps. That you have the will to make choices and decisions. That's what I call individuality. Sounds like a two-year-old. <laughs> From the moment we incarnate, we're an individual. From the moment we incarnate into the womb, we're an individual. Right? We're aware, we're self-aware. And if I pass in that state, so if I pass and I've been miscarried, I am still... In, of, of the process of incarnation has been completed because I am self-aware. Before the time of incarnation, I was not self-aware. Right? And I'm talking the first incarnation. Right? That is a totally different state to personality. Personality is traits that God designed inside of you, which are unique to you and no one else has, or that are similar to what other people have, it's just the combination of those things, inside of your soul, and that personality existed before you were aware of it. And that's what I call personality. There's a sense of humour coming to that? Of course, all, all sorts of things come into that. Although a lot of, be careful with a lot of qualities nowadays that we judge in people, because with a lot of qualities what we do is we judge that quality is good or that quality is bad. In reality, a lot of our qualities that we think are qualities are actually just injuries. Mm. Right? Mm. So you know how there's a lot of books nowadays that say, oh, you're that type of person or you're this type mm. of person. This one that goes uh, choleric. Flemic. Flematic. What's it called? The Maya Briggs Personality Classic. That's it, that's it, yeah. <coughs> when you think about it, the majority of it is based on injury. The pers a person who's constantly upset and angry and projecting that on others, I don't call that a personality. I call that emotional injury. Because mm. right? in the end, all of you, once you're at one with God, you won't do that. Mm. So it must be an injury. Right? We just think it's a part of our personality, but it's not. It's not a part of our personality. It's an emotional injury that we gathered through the course of our life from the moment of incarnation onwards. Something that can determine, like... Like if we can define ourselves within that, is that something that can be a guide to us to show us that we're these are our emotions that, that need to be fixed up? Yeah, if we start define, if you've defined yourself as like an angry type of person or a, or a get up and go type of person or a person <coughs> that never wants to sit down or a person that you know all these different things, mm. the truth is that majority of those definitions are actually injury based. <coughs> they're not. Mm. They're not personality. Personality is totally different to that. Serene feeling. Uh -huh. With the I Ching as well? Sorry? With the I Ching as well? I don't know. The profile's based on the I Ching. Ah, uh, anything that profiles you, anything that profiles you generally does not allow for your expression of free will. In other words, it doesn't allow you to change who you are. And God gave you free will, so therefore God gave you the ability to also change who you are. Like the Zodiac. Right. You're this sort of a person. Yeah. The zodiac is a similar thing. So all of those things, while there are certain truths of attraction of certain personalities at certain times of the year and so forth, there are certain universal features of function that, that cause certain attractions. None of them define you. Right? You are defined by the emotions that exist in your soul and the personality mixed with the personality that God gave you. So have we made up these, these immense systems of, like, you know, like the Zodiac and all the, the Maya Greeks, and just yep. to occupy ourselves or entertain <laughs> ourselves or something? Yeah, to create our realities. Remember in the channeling, if you, 
if you see the DVDs from uh, January, in the channeling with Lucinda, remember what she said about Six Fear Spirits? She said that they create huge sideway realities, right? That are beyond your intellectual comprehension right at the moment. Billions and billions and billions of different realities are created in that location. And you move from one to the other as you think you're pro progressing. You're moving from one to another, to another, to another, to another, to another. They're never growing higher than that, but they're moving from one. And what's happened is many of their realities is filtered down through their connections with people on Earth onto what things we've constructed here on Earth. So things like the Zodiac, for instance, came from spirits. Right? All of those things came from spirits in order to, you know, to as a, as a reflection of the reality of what they believe is real. And, and imposed onto persons on the earth. So what sort of things came from God direct? Anything? Mm -hmm. There's only one thing that comes from I've been telling you what it is already. Twins? Are they soulmates? No. Not generally. So maybe in early stages they could have been, but nowadays twins are generally not soulmates. Was the one thing divine love that came Yes, of course. I thought it was sex. <laughs> well, that's included in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> Where um, that being sold is then filtered through the parents' promotional stuff at the time. Yeah. Why? Why? <coughs> in what way, why? Um, why? Why is what? Um, why? Is that um, uptake by that soul at that time of these other souls' stuff? Yep. Why does it happen? Or why is it necessary? Or is it? The way God created your soul was that you absorb everything from your environment automatically. Mm. That's the way God created your soul. In the end, when you get back to that pristine state, you will be in that state where you absorb automatically everything coming from your environment. The bits that resonate with you will feel painful. The bits that don't resonate with you will pass straight through you. And the bits that are pleasurable for you will also pass straight through you. Right? It's only the bits you hold on to that will feel painful. Now, God created that because that is the perfect, and you will understand this as you progress, that, that that is the perfect way for you to exist. The perfect way for you to exist is to feel every emotion at the time you feel it, with no impediments. That's the perfect way for you to exist. And every single child who incarnates is in that perfect state. Mm. But the problem is, they are not self-aware. So they do not know how to interpret mm. these emotions and where they're coming from. Whereas as adults, we now have the ability, as part of our growth, to become aware that, hang on a sec, I don't need to accept that emotion. And I'm not talking about hang on a sec here. I'm talking about hang on a sec in our feelings. We don't feel that we have to absorb that emotion because the emotion just, we absorb all the emotion, but it just passes straight through us. It's not resonating with us. With the child, it, it passes into them and, and passes through them, but in the process causes damage to them because they are damaging emotions. Right? And the only way that we can, we can't avoid that from happening unless we're like at one with God, or in a six-fear state. In a six-fear state, you will not have damaged emotions generally that will harm your children either. That's how Ammon and a man were created. So the key thing is for you to be aware is that the soul, in its pristine state, was made to absorb everything. God made it that way so that you would all feel at one with each other, so that you'd all feel like you're connected with each other, so that you'd all feel like you love each other and so forth. That's how God made it. Right? But the problem is our emotions cause separation. The emotions of the parents cause separation. If I feel the emotion say, at a moment of fear and I allow myself to, to feel that and explore it, but in, by doing so it prevents me from moving forward with what I, really, what I was actually doing at that moment. Yep. How, how, do I, how do I manage that? Right. So there's a philosophy, feel the fear and do it anyway sort of thing. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then there's a philosophy of, all right, let's get to our fear. There's something that we're fearing. What is it? What are we afraid of? So right at the moment, we're feeling fear. Let's say, I'm afraid to speak up in a public setting. How many of you have that fear? Quite a few. All right. So you should be able to relate to this feeling, right? What's the feeling underneath the fear? What's going to happen when you speak up in the public sector? People will judge me. I'll be judged. I won't be believed. You said it wrong. Children shall be seen and not heard. Wrong. Yeah. Need to be silent. Rejection. Rejection. Can you see? In a could and all we're doing with this fear is we're saying, this, by staying in a state of fear, we're actually saying, I'm, I'm so afraid that I can't feel that emotion. In other words, I don't want to feel that emotion. All right? So when I'm in a state of fear, the first thing I need to do is ask myself, why do I feel afraid? And I might say, oh, oh there's lots of women in the audience and two of them I find attractive. <laughs> no, Thank you. That, that could be happening, right? <laughs> now that doesn't mean you're all not attractive, ladies. It's just, <laughs> this is a feeling somebody could have. <laughs> Myself, I find my soulmate very attractive. So I could feel that, and then I think, oh no, they're going to feel certain things about me. Mm. So I could identify that particular emotion then, right? So what am I afraid of feeling? I'm afraid of feeling women that I am attracted to rejecting me and I don't want to feel that emotion so I get into a state of fear. Mm. <coughs> right. Allow yourself to feel that emotion and this fear disappears. If that's the reason for that fear. How big are the long list out? <laughs> well, like I said, I had 33 pages. So, you know. I don't want to beat that. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's possibly people that could. Uh, it's not much of a competition, though. <laughs> hey, Jay, just changing the subject slightly, how did God get there? I've got no idea. <laughs> how did God get there? And the answer is, I've got no idea. Yeah. Uh, and how can I have an idea? I'm not God. Like, how can I have an idea without God showing me how God got there? And how can I even get into a state emotionally where I can cope with that information? I'm not in that state emotionally. Even in the 20 second sphere, I was not in that state emotionally where I could cope with that information. But there are more spheres and you could find out. Well, there's no more spheres at the moment, but there soon will be. As people go and progress <laughs> further and further. Yeah. So with all these baby cells being created, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, if it keeps yeah. And, um... yeah. One of the things you realise as you're progressing is how little you know about God. The more you know, it's a bit like the more you know almost about any subject physically here, eh? mm -hmm. the more you realise that you don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, how, how much don't they know about the human body? Mm. Not a lot. Huge amounts, isn't it? Got so no idea. There's other places other than Earth, isn't there? These souls have all that sort of Yeah. There's other, like this. There's other worlds that are functioning in a similar manner, yeah. Some are more advanced than ours because they have learnt the lessons of love and some are less advanced than ours because they haven't. And that's not spheres, that's... <coughs> that, that's physical places in this physical universe. And can you go there when you're in the sixth sphere? You can visit any place in your, when you're in the, spirit, in the spirit world where you long to go. Sleep And the sleep state, same thing, yeah. Anyway, it must be time for a break. Um, just before I go for a break, though, um, I've been talking for... Uh, Three hours. Two and a half hours. Oh, close. And, and I need to have a bit of a rest. So those of you who want to talk to me individually, I'm sorry, but for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to sit up the front and be silent. And, uh, just, feel, and just feel some things.